Recording stopped. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the April 9th, 2024 meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Certainly. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Friend? Here. Hernandez? Here. McPherson? Here. And Cummings? Here. Um, with that, I'd like to ask if there's any member of the board who would like to dedicate today's moment of silence. Nope. Seeing none, I will just take a moment to have a moment of silence. Thank you. I'd like everyone to join us uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. We lead this to the flag of the United States of America, to do the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Next item on our agenda is consideration of late additions to the agenda, additions and deletions to consent and regular agenda. So I'd like to ask the CAO, Mr. Carlos Palacios, if there's any additions or deletions to the agenda today. Uh, Chair Cummings and members of the board, yes, there are a number of additional materials and corrections. On the regular agenda, item number seven, there's additional materials. There's a new attachment, budget and brief, which is inserted after packet page 24. On item number 10, there's additional materials. There's a revised memo, packet page 80, replaced. Executive su summary, sentence three should read. Ballots have been mailed and must be received by the close of April 9th, 2024, public hearing. There's also a revised memo, packet page 81, replace discussion, paragraph three, sentence three should read, ballots have been mailed and must be received by the close of the April 9th, 2024, public hearing. On item number 11, there's additional materials, revised memo, packet page 83 is replaced. The executive summary sentence three should read, ballots have been mailed and must be received by the close of the April 9th, 2024 hearing. On the consent agenda, uh, item number 13 is removed, uh, asking the board to remove that item. Uh, it's not quite ready. And then item number 40 on the consent uh, agenda, there's additional materials. There's a revised attachment C resolution confirming benefit assessment rates for CSA 53, FY 24, 25, packet pages 428 through 435 are replaced. Thank you. That concludes the corrections. Thank you very much. Are there any members of the board that would like to remove an item from the consent to the regular agenda? Seeing none, with that will open up. Uh, public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to items that are not on the agenda, or if they would like to speak to an item that's on the regular agenda, just note that you will not be able to speak on that item again when that item is presented. And so with that, um, we'll start with the first speaker here in person. Yeah, good morning. My name is James Ewing. It's February, April 9th. So some people in the room are going to be talking about the Mountain Charlie Road situation. You know, I've been doing professional business in this county for more than 25 years. I moved here in 1905. I was happy to be a road manager for a couple of years on Oak Ridge Road. Now, dealing with the permit process with the county of Santa Cruz, where at one time it was had the largest building department in the state of California, even though it's the second smallest county, you know, you need to go in there with actually the answers. I mean, I have a friend who lost his road on Mountain Lion Lane Initially, the repair was 30,000, and then some bureaucracy was saying they needed to drill down 90 feet to bedrock. It became like 300,000. 
So I'm not sure what the state of that road is, but um, as a suggestion, you know, there are people that are still alive that have been doing road work for 40, 50, 60, 70 years that I personally know. And uh, what seemed to work for a long time, you know, almost 100 years ago is going to work now. So sometimes you just have to fix things on your own. And, um, you know, it's not that I can recommend any lawyers for lawsuits, but uh, there's just a lot of things going on that people aren't aware of. You know, what's going on with that deliberate um, explosion of the bridge, the Sir Francis Key, that was controlled demolition. It's my understanding that at the time, an average of 4,900 vehicles crossed that bridge every day. That's commerce adding up to an average of $28 billion a day, which is over $10 trillion a year. If we don't think that's going to trickle down to the West Coast, it really is. So just because you guys are pushing the Agenda 21 stuff doesn't mean people can as politely as possible say no. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Cummings, members of the board. Uh, Marcus Pimentel once said to me in a meeting, ISD are the heroes that no one knows about. And so today we are here to celebrate the retirement of one of those heroes, Eric Howe. And I'm going to turn it over to his manager, Stacy Lake. Hi. Hi, board uh, members. Um, I'm Stacy Lake, as Tammy mentioned, and this is Eric Howe. Um, we've worked together um, in ISD. We started out in the uh, basement, working with computers on the mainframes, and here we are today. Anyways, thank you for the proclamation. I'm going to read this out loud. Whereas it is a great pleasure that we acknowledge the outstanding contribution and commitment of Eric Howe, who has served the County of Santa Cruz for nearly 25 years, and whereas Eric joined the county in March of 20, 2001 as a mainframe operator holding various system analyst positions being before being promoted to ISD System Administration Analyst 2 in 2017 in the Information Services Department. And whereas Eric has served as a dedicated, loyal, and consistent employee providing excellent IT service to over 3,000 county employees, backing up their data and then restoring it for them when needed, needed, which was many times, um, and closing over 5,800 tickets. And that's why we've been keeping track of the ticket system. There were six years before that when we weren't. So he's closed a lot of tickets. Um, he has displayed an unwavering commitment to excellent in, excellence in each position he held in ISD. And his work ethic, professionalism, and attention to detail have earned him the respect and admiration of his colleagues. And whereas Eric officially retires on April 12th, 2024, from the Santa Cruz County, uh, we will sure miss him. Um, we are sure we will miss it. He will miss the county just as much as the county will miss him having them on their team. We know he will enjoy the new chapter, buying a house and moving to Michigan with his wife, Tracy. Um, now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, uh, chair of the County, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors hereby thank you, honor, and commend Eric Howell for his dedicated years to the service of the County of Santa Cruz. Thank you, everyone. I want to thank the Board of Supervisors, great people of the County of Santa Cruz, Tammy Weigel, Stacy Lake, and of course, my wife supported me the whole time I've been here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your service and you. have fun in your retirement. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Catherine Sarto. I'm a COPA leader from Peace United Church on High Street. And I want to thank um, all of you. Your, uh, all of you for your work on preventing homelessness and working with COPA to come up with some measures that will help that. Um, we, um, uh, we are looking to develop useful tenant protections and measures to prevent homelessness. At our COPA Candidate Accountability Assembly in late January, uh, COPA promised to get out the vote on the city and the county tax measures. We did that. We canvassed, we registered voters, we talked to families and friends. And the, the both measures passed, and we feel that this is a clear commitment from not only um, our side, but, you know, the COPA community, which includes 30 congregations, uh, unions, et cetera, um, across the two-county area. Um, but I'm here to ask you to make good on the promise to allocate a significant amount of the income from that uh, the county tax measure 
toward efforts that would uh, protect tenants, prevent homelessness, and to work on helping people understand both tenants and um, landlords' rights and, and the code, the uh, laws that, that prevail there. Um, just one example of a parishioner of one of our COPA member institutions. She's facing eviction now. She has two children who have been stable in their home for 10 years, attending local schools, contributing to the community. And as always, eviction, um, or not always, but very often eviction results in immediate homelessness. So um, we look forward to working with you and hoping that you guys will act now. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Gloria Carroll, Child Welfare Director. And I just wanted to take a few moments to thank you all for adopting the proclamation to make April Child Abuse Prevention Awareness Month. Uh, last fiscal year, we received over 2,300 calls for child abuse and neglect and served over 200 youth out of home. We are really working hard to kind of shift this perception of abuse and lack of um to prevent less system involvement. And it's really important. A lot of our community providers are here because we want to strengthen our relationships with the community to help develop a shared responsibility so that we don't get so many calls for youth that are not abused and neglected. And I wanted to take a moment to introduce my colleague, Laura McLean, who is leading some of our prevention work in the community. So thank you so much. Really hopeful that you all will consider our flag raising ceremony at the end of the month. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for your time today. My name is Stephanie Brown Liu. I'm the executive director of the Positive Discipline Community Resources, a local nonprofit that supports parents and families. And I'm also the co-chair of the Children's Network for United Way of Santa Cruz County and a part of the Child and Youth Wellbeing Cabinet. And I'm also a mother, a local mom here of a nine, almost 10 year old little boy and a one and a half year old little girl. And so child abuse prevention is so important to me in my heart, my home, my community. And I'm really grateful for the board for accepting this uh, proclamation for mm -hmm. Child Abuse Prevention Month and Awareness Month. The Children's Network is a convening body out of the United Way of Santa Cruz County County that supports in providing greater access and awareness amongst us as service providers, educators, and decision makers to understand where are the gaps and where are the possibilities. I would like to read a couple of the whereas statements from the proclamation. Whereas every community has a stake in the safety, permanency, and well-being of its children, and by promoting and supporting programs and services that provide resources for children and families, the community can be effective in preventing child abuse and neglect. Whereas the United Way of Santa Cruz County's Children Networks partners with Family and Children's Services, who brings public education, government, and nonprofit agencies together to improve youth and well-being through improving school attendance, and linking families to resources that support children and youth. And so I do invite you, as um, as Gloria mentioned, to April 26th, Children's Memorial Flag Raising. That will be an educational event complete with uh, prevention tip sheet packets and an opportunity to have a moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, Supervisors. I am Lynn Petrovic, the Executive Director of Casa of Santa Cruz. Um, and I'm Liz Poit. I'm the director of Safe Families for Children, a nonprofit in town that works to reduce child abuse and neglect and prevent foster care whenever possible. It's no surprise that we are both here in support of the proclamation for Child Abuse Prevention Month. Um, I am here. We are here also representing the Family and Child Wellbeing Cabinet. Um, and we know the cabinet that's our, our driving mission is to strengthen families to prevent child abuse. We know that every case of child abuse is preventable when our families have the support that they need. And so we'd like to thank you on behalf of the cabinet um, for all of the resources that you put into our families in the county. So thank you for that. And we look forward to seeing you hopefully at the end of the month at the flag raising ceremony. Thank, thank you. you. I am uh, Scott Dalo. Um, I represent the Mountain Charlie uh, Road community. The sign right here. Um, I'd like to point out that, that today I just want to bring up awareness, and later on in future meetings, I'd like to bring up uh, solutions that we could do to work together to solve this problem. So uh, back in February, 
this year we had a catastrophic failure on Mountain Charlie Road, and it, it blocked uh, any access for people and also emergency vehicles. And we understand that there's 600 plus miles of road that you uh, guys have to maintain, and it's just this one small piece here. We feel Mountain Charlie has a couple of different aspects about that uh, you know deserve your attention. One is that we're parallel Highway 17, and it is an alternate route for emergency vehicles in you know critical situations to to go through. So we like to highlight that point. The other uh, three points I'd like to bring up is that you know if there's a fire, you know CGU happened, and we'd be naive to believe it won't happen again. There's no access for us to get out if a fire were to happen on the south side. There, I mean, we could you know walk across, but just the the, the logistics of getting through are really challenging. So I'd like to highlight that. Also, we've had two incidents now with, with emergency vehicles uh, getting access to, uh, to the road to deal with an emergency situation. It's not that they couldn't make it up the road. It's that the traffic going down south of this, this narrow road has, has increased so much that actually the, there's been almost a collision with emergency vehicles trying to, trying to get access up to the road. So, so that's the point. The road is really not designed for that. And I want to bring that up to your attention. And the fourth thing is that I'd like to bring up for your attention is that it's just the the impact of the, everybody's life, especially the kids who have to commute to school. The 15-minute commute to like Loma Prieta Elementary School has now a 45-minute commute, and that's if Highway 17 has no traffic. So anyways, I want to bring up those points in a future meeting. I'd like to bring up some solutions where we can work together to solve this problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello. Uh, good morning, board. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, the two minutes for myself and my neighbors. We're here today um, to show you that we are human and our lives matter, that we're not just a piece of paper that uh, you can continue to ignore. I have been um, shot at. I have had a gun held to me. A high-powered rifle has been shot through my front yard where my daughter used to park. Uh, I've had my dog uh, stolen, my neighbor's dog's leg macheted. Another neighbor had his dog put in his drinking water, and that is from the skinhead Nazi that the sheriff, Jim Hart, allows to continue to terrorize, vandalize, get away with felonies, as compared to a 16-year-old in New York that stole a backpack and was in Rikers for three years. Richard Negabon had three felonies. The first one was cocaine possession, and that one was dismissed. Again, he's white. He's not black. The second one he had was a shot off uh, shotgun, and that one was a misdemeanor. If he had pled guilty to his third one, which was a stolen gun loaded in a vehicle on his person, the plea deal was we'll strike the um on his person if you plead guilty to a felony. I'm asking that the board institute stat right now a red flag law against this person that continues to shoot us and the sheriff does nothing but support and write an argument in favor of him. Here are more victims of Richard Negabon, Jim Hart, and Bruce McPherson for not doing his job Hello, my name is Dave Brindle, and we own a property across from said person. Um, personally, I haven't had any problems with them, but I did have a one of my um, friends go up camping on the property, and they got into argument and exchanged the, whatever thirty rounds. They they was shot back and forth at each other, which um, I don't think anyone should have to live with. Um, you know, if you get an argument that you're going to have gunfire, people shooting at you. And uh, when you try to get the police to come up, they just um, they're, they refuse to come up. They won't come up. They won't even tell them you want to what? Hey, you know, you, you can't go shooting at people. We don't pull out guns for these, this type of stuff. <laughs> you know, so that's that's about all I have to say is, um, you know, it's like no one's willing to go up there. And, you know, if you're in the city of. Santa Cruz and someone says, oh, I pulled out a gun and I was firing it, right? You'd expect there'd be a lot of police there and, and they would take care of it right away. But, you know, it, it's almost like um, I had one police officer say, 
I don't, I don't have no names, but he said, unless a judge orders me to go up there and do something, there's absolutely nothing I can do. And, and it was, it was left at that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm a neighbor as well. But can, you, can you speak into the microphone, please? Could you pull it down close to your face? There you go. Um, that was my husband, David Brindle. This is my neighbor. Um, she has a permanent injunction order that can be enforced right now. And Patty is an expert in substance abuse. Excuse me, ma'am. If I can have you please speak to us since you're at the podium. I'm sorry. Um, she's um, done all the research. I've had my experiences in the past before Richard even moved in. We had a situation with a different neighbor who was very aggressive, very intimidating. When I called the sheriff, he straight up told me, what makes you think we're going to do anything about it? It's distressful. I'm here now. I have a child. I go camping with my husband, with my child, my dogs, my cat, my mother that's in her 80s, and the sheriff we know will not come to help us if anything happens. And now hearing um, our neighbor's experience, who is newer to me, it's distressful that it's even gotten even worse, that we have a skinhead that's trying to take over, intimidate all the neighbors, and vandalizing the water that they're drinking. To me, that is like attempt to kill. It's not right. Anything else? Thank you very much. I want the red flag law. It can be initiated now. Biden's written it. Ma'am, thank you. You had you had your two minutes. Thank you so much. Morning. Uh, good morning, board. My name is Eli Holiday. I'm an organizer with COPA, Communities Organized for Relational Power and Action, a union of 30 churches, unions, schools in Santa Cruz and Monterey County. And I think you all had the pleasure, maybe the mispleasure of meeting with us at some point over your tenure. Um, I'm here today for two reasons. The first is to commend the board and Supervisor Cummings for a resolution on the consent agenda, which supports AB 2493, a common sense law at the state level. Um, limits the practice of um, charging unscrupulous application fees for people that are applying for multiple units within the same property management holding company. Just as an example for this, I met with somebody yesterday whose family paid over $2,000 on application fees in their apartment search, which if you live paycheck to paycheck quickly becomes a huge barrier towards getting into a new apartment. And oftentimes those people end up on the street. So we want to commend the um, the Board of Supervisors for that. The second thing is as we get into the budget season, um, I just want to remind the board that a pound of, or sorry, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of care. And as we're looking towards practices which can limit and eliminate, hopefully, homelessness in our communities, we want to think about how can we keep the people that are currently housed in homes? How can we create more housing for those people? Um, thank you, board. Thank you. Yes, hello, Mila Boyka for First District. And um, I'm a good example being victimized for 12 years already. And um, it's extremely difficult to get help in this county. I don't understand why it is impossible to assign, do you know, some person, do you know, and keep track on that assignment if uh, the person really helps, the person who works for county. Because it seems like, you know, it's a lot of people works for county. They all get paid very high, you know, high salary, but there is no accountability. I never seen here one person who was kept accountable. What I saw, you know, my complaints, you know, that I filed for 12 years, you know, it's uh, probably a thousand complaints. And all those, many of those people got retired, you know, they got farewell letters from your board for their great job. So their great job to victimize people. I, you know, agree with everybody who talked to me, with uh, talked to you before me, because this is what really happened. You know, it's like, look like criminal syndicate. There is no, well, no way to get help from sheriff department. There is no way. And if you begin to complain, so you're going to be, you know, victimized horribly. And especially they're using like, criminals on probation that they let out who will terrorize, you know, 
their enemies and enemies we are who was victimized by the county and this is mental health department who is on top of every department and they lead everything in the county so you re really need to take care of mental health department and the, there is like their claims that they need more workers is useless because they need first of all you know to take care of current workers thank you Before we speak, is there any member of the public who'd like to speak during oral communications at this point in time? Seeing no more people, you'll be the last person in public, and then we'll move on to our online participants. My name is Dan Crenshaw. I'm also one of the residents affected by the Mountain Charlie situation, and Scott did a really good job of spelling out the things that are going on. I need to emphasize, this is not just an inconvenience for the residents. It's not adding an hour to your commute. It's not getting kids up 45 minutes before you get them to school because you got to go to Scott's Valley to come back up the hill. This is human life we're talking about. The fires we talked about, and here are the mudslides. If there's other parts of Mountain Charlie that are kind of pending to slide out that will trap residents up there. There's already five houses up there that are trapped. Um, we've worked with the county. We've had meetings with the county, and I would like for the county to step up a little bit more the responses and kind of the deadpan looks that we're getting aren't effective. This is a major concern. Mountain Charlie has not been maintained adequately for years. We pay our property taxes. Other things in the county get fixed. And now when we're in trouble, now when we need help, now when we're actually trying to get something accomplished, there's no funds. I think that the county needs to figure out where to get those funds and do it quickly. This road cannot be slid up like this for very long. The incidents with, uh, with the uh, emergency vehicles, anybody gets hurt, it's, it's human life will be lost because of an action of the county. The county needs to take action and needs to take it now. Thank you. Director Machado. Thank you, Chair and Supervisors. Matt Machado, uh, Director of CDI. I do want to provide a quick update on Mountain Charlie since, since we're here talking about it. Um, the last two weeks, it's still moving quite a bit where it's moving about a foot a week. And so that's significant. So it's, um, we really need the, the movement to slow down so that we could start engineering a solution. Yesterday, we did cut in a ramp on the south side so that we could get a, a drill rig down into the, to the slide itself so that we could install an in, inclinometer so that we could start measuring the movement, the depth of it, and start engineering a solution. So I would tell you that the county is committed to a solution to solving this problem. It's a major problem, uh, but we're at the, um, we're, we're just at the hands of mother nature. And so we're waiting for the appropriate time. We actually were gonna cut in a ramp on both sides yesterday, but the north side is still just too wet. We couldn't get equipment in there. So we're trying, we're moving as quick as we can. So I just wanted to assure the board that we're moving, we're taking action and we're we're gonna solve it. It's just it's gonna take mother nature's cooperation and, uh, and some time. So thank you. Thank you for that update. All right, we'll move on to our online participants. Um, are there any members of the public online who'd like to speak to us at this time? Yes, Chair, we have speakers. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. <laughs> Excuse me, Marilyn Guerra. Um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, I call it, and pressing people to get vaccinations. We need to look at um, in some depth, depth as to what's really going on. Uh, I'm referring to a book here, and this is for everyone, excellent um, facts. The Contagion Myth, Why Viruses, Including Coronavirus, Are Not the Cause of Disease by Dr. Thomas S. Cowan and Sally Fallon Morrell. And um, he speaks, and this is from an interview with him on the same topic. Um, talks about a lot of people being sick and how they've never isolated this virus for COVID-19. So quoting here, 
So there are a lot of sick people. Now, most of the sick people are just the usual sort of sick people. But there are some sick people who are hypoxic and have what's called a hyper-inflammatory state. Now, how do they get hypoxic? It has nothing to do with a virus. Viruses don't make you hypoxic, but we do know from clear scientific research going back to the 70s, the Naval Intelligence Research Institute did this, the Soviets did this, and there was a recent paper on it. Then if you explode, expose a place to millimeter waves, otherwise known as 5G, these things... <laughs> Mary, your microphone's now available. Mary, your microphone is now available. And as a reminder, you can either accept the unmute or you can use star six to unmute yourself. Okay. Moving on to the next speaker. Tim, your microphone is now available. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Yes, my name is Tim Delaney, and I have spoken before all of you before. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Um, <clears throat> I have an idea here. I have a lot of issues here trying to get toxic waste and uh, e-waste and things like that out of my home. And uh, things have evolved over the last 10 years where politicians and counties and whatnot and these uh, transfer stations and, and garbage facilities here are uh, clamping down and preventing homeowners like myself, whether I live in California or Nevada or anywhere, uh, from bringing our stuff out of our homes and to these landfills. And having me drive all over the entire county, you know, and you have all these other little programs and everything, and I get here and there and everywhere, and everyone refuses me, that's not working. So what's happening here is a lot of homes, you have all these substances building up, and if you ever do get a fire, all that stuff is going to go into your aquifers, okay? And into your creeks, rivers, ponds, oceans, everything. And I'm assuming that some of you surf and you don't want that. So what you can do is get right-wing politics and left-wing politics together and approach the university down there. And instead of people just getting a student loan payoff, maybe you can have these folks show up at the Ben Lamone transfer station on a Saturday and you can give them a job and you can set up a new hazmat team here and let them earn it before you go ahead and just give them the money to pay off their student loan. That way, a guy like me that's trying to clean house and whatnot, I come down there and yay, I have a garbage facility here that's receptive and can take all the things out of my home, okay? That's good for everybody and it helps our environment. Um, it's wonderful, all right? So that's my idea. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Bernie, your microphone's now available. Yeah, good morning, buenos dias, uh, Board Cummings and uh, Chair Cummings, sorry, and the rest of the board. Uh, Bernie Gomez here, District 3, uh, born and raised in District 4, work for Milpa. Um, so there's a couple things, uh, and I think uh, I know we have the budget presentation, so I'll, I'll hold off on some of those comments for, for that time, right? But I do want to say, um, I think uh, just, I think it's it's critical that we find a way for this process for the budget to be uh, accessible to the community, right? Um, I I know that in Monterey County, they have but uh, each supervisor um, has a uh, budget meetings, right? Where they get input, they get input from their constituents, you know, uh, and sometimes there there are just a general public meetings around uh, the budget process that allows for dialogue, input from the community, right? Where the community actually is involved in this process, you know, and and uh, some of those requests or concerns are actually brought up to the board and it's uh, presented in the in the presentation. So 
Uh, hopefully we can get that going, right? Um, so that's that. Also, I just really wanted to emphasize uh, down in uh, South County, right? I was driving through, uh, I believe it's probably District 2, it's down under the road, right, over by, uh, yeah, in the back uh, the back there. So just looking at the um, at the paved road, right, Th those roads, you know, it's just nice and paved, but then when you drive down West, uh, West Beach, right, uh, that road is is always been just, just yeah, just it's always it's still dilapidating. You know, it's just a horrible road to to drive, and that's the only uh, access we have to the beach. So thinking about uh, getting this board to also take time to invest in in West Beach Road, right? Just like San Andreas Road. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay. With that, I'll bring it back to the board to see if there's any questions, comments, on items on our consent agenda. I'll start with Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, on the consent agenda, item 15, the second read of the ordinance relating to motorized bikes, scooters, and e-bikes, I'd like to provide additional direction that we not go ahead and approve this just yet. I heard from Ecology Action as well as some other constituents um, that they have concerns particularly about the section that relates to county parks um, with concerns in particular ecology action has concerns because they do a lot of bike education and outreach in our community and utilize county parks when doing so um, they may they use county parks also uh, or, or see county parks as an essential part of our often fragmented bike infrastructure I think we may be able to address this uh, with meeting with county parks and ecology action and, and others uh, to ensure that there's clear designation of the bikeways um, as defined in the ordinance uh, within these portions of our parks. But I just think we need a little bit more time to be certain and, and make sure we have plans in place uh, to define those bikeways if needed. Um, so I'd like to provide additional direction that we not approve this ordinance today, direct staff to meet with ecology action and health services agency, uh, which also does um, outreach related to bike safety and return on May 14th for our first read. Supervisor, that would need to be pulled from the consent agenda um, and and discussed if you if um, to to make the additional direction and to to do the things that you're um, proposing be done. Um, the item would need to be removed from the consent agenda and then commented on, and and we would go through the whole the whole procedure. Um, so you would need to um, um, take it off the consent agenda. Okay. Um, but I guess I'd like to. I, I'm sorry for, I didn't realize procedurally that that had to be done, uh, but I'd like to request that we remove item 15 yep. to the regular agenda. Okay, so we'll, we'll pull item 15 from the break, from the consent and move that to the regular agenda. And then if you have any further comments on the consent agenda. I just wanted to uh, thank the chair for item 28, urging support for AB 2493, prohibiting landlords from charging application screening fees to enter waiting lists when no rental unit is available within a reasonable period. Uh, we heard today from a number of folks in the community, particularly Ms. Catherine Sardo from COPA and Mr. Eli Holliday. Uh, we have had extensive conversations um, with COPA and a number of their members about some of the hardships uh, that folks are experiencing when trying to find housing in our community. Uh, I think there's a number of things that the county can do, especially in partnership with uh, our uh, folks in the state legislature to try to address this. This is, uh, seems like one very reasonable first step um, and I'm uh, happy to support it. So as a friend. Thank you. Just two brief comments, one on 5051 and 52, which are all storm related uh, damages we uh, heard today, although these were from previous year's storms. Just appreciate the work that Public Works did throughout the county uh, to bring some of these back uh, in line, in particular on the culvert side in the second district on 53, the Aptos Library completion. Uh, it's just been a beautiful sight to see so many members of the community using that that space. It was a a long project and a challenging project, but it's it's a gift to uh, the community moving forward. So just uh, a lot of appreciation for the teams that work behind the scenes on, on all those issues. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, on item number 20, I want to acknowledge and thank um, the work of our county clerk, uh, Tricia Weber, and her elections department uh, for doing a great job in the March 5th election cycle. I'm glad to see that Santa Cruz County continues to surpass the state average. It was just uh, below uh, 50%, but that uh, being a concern of its own, it's better than most every other county in the in the state. So uh, thank you for those who did vote. And 
I think it's a couple points needed to be uh, made. Uh, I think about 90% of the people who voted did by mail. Uh, interesting. Uh, they're not going to the polls. is is not a complete surprise, but 90% of them voting by mail is uh, is quite significant, I think. And I think uh, some we need to, uh, those voters, especially who didn't vote, every vote counts. And it was never more uh, recognizable than the uh, election f to replace an issue in Congress. There was a, a, a number of people who uh, ran for that office. Um, and uh, Sam Licardo, the former mayor of, of San Jose, was the top vote getter. But second were former state senator, now county supervisor Joe Simidian, and Mr. Lowe, who ended up second with the exact same number of votes. Exactly. Never been happened. Never happened before. So now in the runoff in November, there's going to be three people on the ballot because the, the top two uh, run. And there's one that was the top and there's two that were two. So there's three people that are going to run. This has never happened before. I mean, it was the exact same number of votes that they got. So every vote counts and don't forget it. And those 53 percent who are registered and didn't vote, please uh, get out to the polls uh, come November. And I wanted to thank also, uh, or th thank, congratulate uh, my colleague, uh, Supervisor Koenig, on his re-election. And I want to thank the voters in the unincorporated area and the cities uh, for their support of Measure K, the uh, county sales tax measure that passed, both inside and outside the unincorporated area. Um, on number 36, the state grant for Mikos or uh, home kitchen operations. And uh, a supervisor friend and I have been working on this for some time. I want to thank the staff and the Environmental Health Department for pursuing this grant to help to offset the costs of starting up our pilot program for the micro enterprise home kip kitchen operations. Uh, some people have really wanted this for some time. Uh, I know we have some folks who are eager to get licensed and get underway. And so I'm looking forward to the ordinance coming back to us uh, in the first part of September. Um, and items, uh, some of those have been mentioned by Supervisor Friend, but 47 to 52, the emergency road repair projects. Um, these six items all represent the hard work of our Public Works Department, or CDI, uh, Community uh, Development and Infrastructure Department. It continues uh, to, despite uh, all of the funding challenges we're having related to our disaster response, which will be discussed uh, in our um, budget item that's coming up. Um, I want to, again, acknowledge uh, our director, uh, CDI uh, director, Matt Machado, who just spoke, uh, our assistant director, Steve Wiesner, who's in charge of roads for the county, and uh, the staff for managing these projects um, with a sense of urgency and keeping the board well informed. And I uh, want to acknowledge also that we're well aware of um, Mount Charlie. We've had two town hall meetings uh, online. Um, it's a, really an unusual disaster that keeps moving, and it's uh, you you can't you got have it. It needs to be settled before you can do the repair work. And I know it's frustrating for the CDI staff and others, but uh, we're we've got our eye on the ball, and it is it's a mess. But um, we're going to get at it as soon as we can when some things are stabilized up in Mount Charlie Road. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Uh, I don't have much just for uh, item number 22. Um, you know, I'm glad we're doing the emergency repairs at the detention center. It's important that we keep our employees and people that are housed there safe as well. Uh, it seems to be like a recurring issue. I think we're going to have to modernize or something. But uh, and then the other thing is I just want to thank all the public for their thoughtful uh, public comment today. Thank you. Um, I just have a few. Um, comments and a couple questions. Um, item number 17, this is um, approve a master service agreement with BMI Imaging incorporated in the amount of 213380 to meet the mandates of Assembly Bill 1466 and for document conversion. Um, this item is in response to um, state legislation, which requires all California counties to redact from deeds and other properties documents uh, any language that is discriminatory or racially restrictive. And I think the intent of this is really good, but I do want to understand a little bit more about will there be some kind of historical, will, will it be historically recorded what those kind of racially and discriminatory language was within these documents? Because um, 
just so people are aware, this was you know properties in the past. Um, if you were African American, if you were Jewish, if you were Asian or of a certain racial class, you couldn't actually purchase the properties. And I think it's really important that we understand our history and we document our history. And, and while it's really important that everyone has opportunity to purchase property, it, it is important for us to remember that mm -hmm. these, these legacies of racism and how it actually led to how our communities are structured. So I'm just wondering if anyone could comment on that. I don't see anybody here from the assessor recorder's office, and I can't speak to how they're going to operationalize this. Um, I, I wouldn't want to speak to it without without their insight. Well, if it's if it's okay with the board, I think it, it would be good for us to get a report on the number of redactions and deletions at the end of this project, so we actually know how many properties within our community actually had these historic racial discriminatory restrictions in place. Um. The next item, item number 38, this is a proven amendment to agreement with Housing Matters for the Harvey West Studios Capital Development Project to use a different type of construction, extend the agreement term, and take related actions. I was just wondering um, if there's any sense of, has, has Housing Matters expressed when they anticipate the project's going to begin? Because I know we've been waiting for a while, um, and I'm just curious if there's any sense of when construction plan for this project. Good morning, Chair Cummings and board members. Um, Randy Morris, Human Service Director of the Housing for Health Division is our department, so I'm standing up to speak to it. I do not have an exact timeline. I can certainly report back to you with an update. As you know, our Director of Housing for Health, Robert Ratner, is in meetings with the city and with that nonprofit every single month. And just for context, this is in front of your board because this is a state earmark that was directed directly to this nonprofit but required local government to hold it and pass the money through. And we're back in front of you for this already approved action because the construction type changed. We needed to change the scope of work, but I can get back to you about the specific date. That'd be great. Thank okay. you. And I guess that concludes all my comments today. And so um, I'll bring it back to the board for action um, items. I just want to. Um, remind us that item 13 has been removed from consent for today and it will it be 11.1 it will be 11.1 no this is 13 was the one that that staff removed right that was the minutes oh, sorry so thank you that's Super the deletion right that's one has been removed the one uh totally but the one that has has been removed from the consent agenda to the regular agenda is item 15 correct item and that 15. will be 11.1 yes correct okay thank and you. then the additional um direction on the report from for item number 17. And so with that, if there's a motion. I'll move consent with the additional direction on item 17. Yeah. 15. 15. I'm sorry, I wasn't. <laughs> no, the additional direction was for 17. Yeah, no, 15 to move to the regular agenda. Yeah. But, second. Okay. The motion from Supervisor Friends, second from Supervisor Koenig. Um, with that, I'll ask the clerk to please call roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Fernandez. Yes. McPherson. Aye. And Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. So with that, we'll move on to our regular agenda. The next item on our agenda is hold a public hearing to consider and accept and file the county's fiscal year 2024-25 proposed budget and continue the budget public hearing to May 21st, 2024. And I'd like to welcome up uh, Marcus Pimentel and Carlos Palacios to lead us on this presentation. Uh, thank you, Chair Cummings and uh, members of the board. Um, I'm very honored today uh, to present to you with the 2024-2025 um, Santa Cruz County budget and uh, want to congratulate uh, Marcus Pimentel on his leadership as well as Nicole Coburn, who led the process as well as our, all of our analysts and department staff. Um, also, um, today I wanted to acknowledge that we did uh, receive in 2022 Challenge Award from uh, the county association, a state association of counties for our online uh, interactive budget website. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Payment will be walking through that so that people are again familiarized with how to navigate through that. Uh, today's presentation, uh, I'm going to start off by presenting a bit of context about the county's uh, financial situation that makes us a little bit unique among other counties. Um, then talk about some of the challenges we're facing in particular. Uh, we are facing a, a major issue with climate change and the impact uh, it is having on our community and on our county budget. 
the response uh, to the natural disasters we have faced since 2017 has become one of the major, in fact, I would say it is the major issue this county now faces and how we will address that in the future uh, is, is very uh, critical for this board. Uh, also talk about some of the challenges having to do uh, with state mandates regarding um, behavioral health and the intersection of behavioral health uh, with the homelessness crisis. Uh, there's a number of different uh, initiatives and state legislation that have been approved that are going to impact us in the years to come that will also have um, another big impact on, on the county's budget and on our operations. And then uh, after that, uh, talk about uh, some of the major uh, achievements and positive things that the county is doing in addressing uh, many of the issues we're facing. There's a lot of good news in this budget. And I want to um, talk to that as well. So one of the, the things that uh, is unique about our county that many counties do not face is that half of our population in our county, of our county population is about 273,000 people. We are considered a suburban mid-sized county by population, but we are uh, unique in that half of our population lives in the unincorporated area, 131,000 people in effect, look to the county for municipal services. And so we have a dual role in that we present, we are um, we are charged with providing state mandated countywide services for the entire population of 273,000 people. But then we are providing city like municipal services with 132,000 people. Um, so basically we are the biggest city in our county. Uh, we're double the size of the city of Santa Cruz and, and considering who we're providing uh, municipal services. Uh, the only city in the region, in our entire uh, Tri-County region, uh, that is bigger than us is the city of Salinas, which has about 176,000 people. And so that is unique in that most counties actually have a much less proportion of their population in the unincorporated area. Uh, Santa Clara County, to give you an example, has only 5% of their population in the unincorporated area. 95% are in cities. So they have the same resources or actually more resources than we do, and yet only provide municipal services for 5% of their population. We get those same um, uh, categories of resources but are charged not only with providing countywide services, but with municipal services for 100 for 50 percent of our population so that is somewhat unique and it provides challenges to to our budget uh, when you look at how we are funded uh, on a per capita basis um, this considers our property tax sales tax utility users tax uh, as well as other funds that we are able to provide services with you'll see that on the very right side of this chart we are among the lowest per capita funded county in the state. Uh, and also we are providing many, many more, um, many services to much greater proportion of the population. So our per capita amount is less, which is less than $2,000 per person. And then if you look at the other access, we're providing those services to 50% of our population. If you look at Santa Clara County, just as one example, uh, they're providing, they get almost um, $11,000 per capita versus our uh, less than $2,000. And yet they're providing services to only 5% of their population for minimus, municipal services. So anyway, that's another context setting um, thing to understand about our budget. If you look at this chart, which is considering the amount of property tax that we receive, the percentage of the dollar that people spend on their property tax. Uh, you will see this is actually using uh, property tax rates, taking out the redevelopment pass through. That's why it's a little lower than we normally talk about. It's 11%. These are percentages uh, of the total dollar that somebody would spend. So in our county, if somebody spends a dollar of property tax, the county gets 11 cents of that. And you can see that we're one of the lowest uh, per, um, amount of percentages of property tax and property tax is by far the most important revenue source that counties receive. Uh, and then you look, uh, look at the other side, uh, San Luis Obispo, as an example, gets 23% of the dollar. It's 23 cents. We own more than double us. Um, 
Mary, uh, if you look at, just check out the other county, San Luis Obispo, um, Merced gets 22 cents, Los Angeles, 20 cents, uh, Sonoma, 19 cents, uh, San Joaquin, 19 cents. So you can see that just the percentage of property tax that we receive uh, is much lower. We're among the lowest in the entire state. This is a legacy of Prop 13 adopted in 1978. Uh, what it did at that point was basically froze the rates that were in that place at that time, whatever the rate, if you remember um, way back in those days, um, local jurisdictions used to set the rate for their property tax. So the boards of supervisors and city councils actually each year set the property tax rate. Um, we happen to be with very low property tax rate at that time, and that's why we were frozen. Other counties were much higher. So anyway, that that also is a very important context setting um, fact. Um, if you look at the average property tax allocation, now this um, you can see on the other side it was 11 percent. This considers 13.4 percent because this does include the proper the redevelopment pass through. Um, in any event, we received 13.4 cents on the dollar. Um, the average for county, for all California counties is 19 cents. Uh, if we were to receive just the average, the 19 cents, uh, we would receive 36 more, 36 million dollars more annually of general uh, revenue. And you can imagine that's just to give you a context. That's much bigger than the entire parks budget. For just an example. Um, many, many times more than the parks budget. Just to give you an example of that. So. Um, in any event, um, $36 million would certainly come in very useful in terms of doing our budget. Uh, if you look at sales tax, this is just a comparison for our um, local cities, given that we are, in effect, the biggest city in our county. If you look at the per capita sales tax, um, we uh, receive much less uh, $180 per residence versus $427 in the city of Santa Cruz. So the city of Santa Cruz just in sales tax receives more than double our per capita revenue. If you look at the city of Santa Cruz hotel tax, they're $198 per capita, we're $135 per capita. So in other words, uh, even when you look at other taxes and compare us to other cities, uh, relatively, we're somewhat underfunded because of the fact that counties typically don't develop as much commercial properties as cities do. Um, another thing that we're keeping a watch on is the state budget deficit. Counties are very dependent on the state budget. Uh, the state budget uh, increased um, from the earlier estimates of $58 billion to $73 billion. Um, this is an estimate by the Legislative Analyst Office. The May revise this year will likely be very consequential. This is the usually typically May 12th, the state issues their May revise when the governor revises the budget based on the latest uh, state income tax information. This will be very consequential for us and for our budget. Uh, so let's get into some of the challenges we're facing. Um, global climate change is happening right now and it is impacting uh, local governments, and state governments and federal governments across the country. We, for years, uh, decades, have been talking about global climate change coming. Uh, well, it has arrived, and we are feeling the force of it. Just in the last seven years, uh, six years, since 2017 to 2023, we had seven nationally, federally declared disasters. Um, in many decades prior to this, we would have one federally declared disaster. And yet we had seven in six years. And you can see that we have spent um, $250 million um, in the last uh, six years on various um, natural disasters. 2017 storms, we spent almost $90 million doing road repairs. Uh, 2020 CZU wildfire, $25 million. 2023 uh, we had two federally declared disasters. We've spent $74 million on road repairs primarily. Uh, and then, of course, we had COVID in there as well. Out of the $250 million we have spent since 2017, 
uh, we've only collected about $115 million from the federal government reimbursed. So we still have outstanding $143 million that we have not collected from the federal government in reimbursements for these emergencies. And so that will be um, a continuing challenge for us in our budget as we are struggling with two issues. How do we maintain our cash flow as we are doing these repairs and waiting on FEMA and federal other federal agencies to reimburse us? Uh, it, we are still collecting 2017. As you can see, since 2017, we still have $69 million outstanding money we've already spent. We've already done repairs that we have not yet collected. So that is uh, a big issue is just the cash flow issue. And then the other thing is that the federal government does not reimburse us 100%. They typically reimburse us on average 70 to 80%. So that local match has been an issue. And so what's happened is that we've been using almost all of our SB1 allocations from the state. You remember SB1 was passed many years. It was an increase to the gas tax and the vehicle license fees meant for road repair. Uh, we have been using almost all of that money, not on road repair in our urbanized areas, but on the match for many of these natural disasters that have taken place. So those are two big issues. The other big issue that we face is that even after we have spent all of this money, $250 million, which, by the way, is a lot of money compared to our budget, uh, we still have uh, 96 sites of 2023 storms that we have not repaired yet. There are still 96 sites outstanding that we have not yet begun repairs on. That The estimate is that's equivalent to $64 million. These are 2023 storm damage. In 2017, we still have $40 million of sites that we have not yet repaired yet. So roads, bridges, damages that have been done due to uh, winter rainstorms, since 2017, we still have $40 million outstanding. So just considering 2023 and 2017 projects that we have not yet done, we have over $100 million outstanding in repairs we need to do. 2024, initial estimates that we have another $10 million. So just this year, we think it's at least $10 million in 2024. So you can see... That is going to be a significant challenge, and this is global climate change. Uh, we are dealing with it just like other counties are and other cities are across the country, right? This is a big issue nationwide, worldwide. Um, in terms of the money that we have spent, $250 million since 2017, you can see that exceeds the total amount of our annual general tax revenue in one year. So that is a significant amount of money in terms of maintaining our cash flow. And then again, the issue with matching that with, with local funds is a big issue. This is just an example of some of the projects that have yet to be completed. Um, this is 2023. We also have, again, there's 96 sites of these that have not yet been done from 2023. We also have many from 20, 20, 2017. This is one on Glen Canyon Road. It's a slip out. Uh, you can see that the estimated cost is $430,000. Again, this is a project very typical of the ones that we've already completed in 2017 and 2023. But this one, in fact, is an, just an example of one that still we're waiting to replete and trying to figure out how we're going to pay for that. This is another example, Hazel Dell Road, uh, another slip out of a road. Um, estimated cost four hundred sixty thousand dollars. There are literally hundreds of these all over the county, and um, to keep pace with projects that have not yet been completed. And again, hundreds of them across the county. There are hundreds that we've already completed. There are hundreds we have still yet to complete. And these are just two examples. Um, COVID has been an issue statewide, and the biggest issue is project room key reimbursements. During COVID, we were assured by the state government and by federal government that we'd be reimbursed. Uh, this is when we took uh, many vulnerable unhoused people and put them in hotels. We had 11 hotels uh, that we contracted with. The county did over a 1,000 people. Um, we were told that we would be reimbursed for the cost and keeping these people, these folks safe. 
Um, now the federal government has gone back and said that they will only, only reimburse us for 20 days for many of these costs, even though we had many people for six months to a year. And during the time we were reassured many times that we would be reimbursed for all of these costs. Now FEMA has said they will not reimburse us for most of these costs, leaving us with an $11 million general fund hit on uh, having to cover these costs. Uh, statewide, it's a $300 million hit for other counties as well. Uh, this is an example of CZU fire. This is debris removal. Um, this is right after the fire took place and we had contractors go in removing all of the burned and fallen trees and power lines and all that other stuff. You can see that the cost was $8.7 million. We spent that. And recently we had an appeal. We're appealing this right because we were denied the recovery by, by FEMA. And again, uh, we spent that money. We will have to be reimbursed. Um, if not, it will be a general fund cost. Uh, we are appealing it right now and hopeful. Uh, but another example of just the issues we're having with all the, the natural disaster reimbursements we're, we're facing. Uh, again, we're not the only one. We, I would say that we're among the hardest hit mostly because of the geographic location of our county and our geographic characteristics, the fact that many of our communities are in vulnerable mountains and on beach low-lying areas. But other counties and cities are being impacted. This is the city of San Diego. Uh, city of San Diego this winter had major storm floods. Um, they are um, having the same issues we are that in terms of cash flow, in terms of local match, in terms of timing of reimbursements. You can see the quote there. It says city officials are hopeful federal, for federal reimbursement, but they know it's not a fast process. Again, we're still waiting from 2017 to get reimbursed for many costs, and their spending is hitting their budget hard. This is city of San Diego. Uh, so uh, you're going to hear in our budget, and we're going to be presenting to you in the coming month a plan to actually issue up to $85 million in debt just to maintain our cash flow for costs that we have already spent on natural disaster response. So this is, again, money we've already spent, 2017, 2023, a CZU. Um, this is not for new projects. This is money that we are waiting to get reimbursed for. We're going to issue a debt of $85 million. This is going to be the largest debt issue capital debt issue we've ever made in this county and it's just to maintain our cash flow uh, the good news is that we will be reimbursed for most of this money over the next few years and so we hope to draw down fairly quickly but it's going to be outstanding any for uh, anywhere from three to five years potentially and we're going to have to pay for that debt service on the 85 million dollars which is going to be in the neighborhood of seven to nine million dollars and that's gonna, there's no funding source for that. That's not reimbursable. So again, another, um, another big challenge uh, facing the county and dealing with climate change. And then we've, you've talked today, the board has and members of the community about Mountain Charlie and the challenges that we're facing. Again, this is one of a very significant problem, um, but there are many others facing the county, uh, countywide. As I said, there's over, there's hundreds of them that we're still waiting from 2017, 2023 to repair. And it's going to be a challenge trying to figure out how do we allocate any funding we do have in the budget, which we do, uh, very limited amounts of money for new responses. Um, and how do we prioritize projects? Um, now let's go on to the state mandates that the, uh, has given to counties. Um, most of these are behavioral health uh, and health, but mainly behavioral health. And they have to do mainly with the intersection of behavioral health and our unhoused population. This has been, um, there certainly is the biggest issue with our unhoused population, of course, is the lack of affordable housing. That is the main issue. But there's also an intersection with behavioral health and our unhoused population. And so, the state has put forward a number of pieces of legislation and mandates on counties to try and ad address this issue of the intersection of behavioral health and the unhoused population across the state. Uh, one issue that affects both uh, health and behavioral health is the CalAIM uh, reforms that are uh, basically 
changing the way that California's Medi-Cal program works, uh, making it much broader with more traditional social service programs, but also changing the way that funds are reimbursed. Uh, so it's very complex in terms of our ability to get reimbursement from the state. But the good part is that it also expands Medi-Cal significantly in terms of what programs and social service programs are allowed to be reimbursed from Medi-Cal. Basically acknowledging that many social services are directly related to health. And so there are new programs, enhanced care management, community supports, which includes housing uh, supports, short-term recovery, independent living. Uh, there are funds for individuals who are incarcerated in their um, pre-release um, care. And then there's numerous behavioral health reforms as well. So you're going to hear about this in the budget, especially when uh, the Health Services Agency and the Human Services Department uh, present their budgets. This is a very, very big deal. It's very complex. On the other hand, it has a lot of opportunities, a lot of good things that could be um, could happen out of this if we take advantage of it. Incompetent to stand trial cap, growth cap. This is a mandate from the state that is um, unfunded. It is basically the issue is somebody who is charged with the felony, uh, arrested, but then ruled incompetent to stand trial. In the past, those individuals referred to the Department of State hospitals where they were restored to competency, returned back to the county, and then would stand trial. They have been explosive growth in the number of people who have been referred to the Department of State Health, Department of State Hospitals for incompetent to stand trial to the point where the state does not have any more capacity. They're at their limits. So what they've done is they set a cap on the number of people we can refer to the Department of State Hospitals. And once we re reach that cop cap, we are um, uh, supposed to either keep them locally in our jail um, and restore them to competency ourselves in the county jail. Or if we do refer them to the Department of State hospitals, if there is capacity and they accept them, we will be charged fees and penalties. And so uh, this is something, a new law that we're monitoring very closely. The sheriff is working with my office, um, Department of Health Services Agency as well, very closely about this, because this could be a very significant issue in the future. Care court is coming in um, this December. It's a framework to deliver mental health and substance use disorder services to the most severely impaired Californians. Um, there's a number of different steps that take place, but it basically allows numerous uh, people who are not currently allowed, but will be allowed to refer people to the court for treatment. This could be a family member, behavioral health provider, first responder, or other um, a social service worker, they can refer the person to the court. There's then required a clinical evaluation by our uh, behavioral health staff. Uh, if there's a care plan that's developed, it's ordered by the court, which is provided by our behavioral health staff and county HSA. And then there's a continuing support for that individual. So this will impact um, many departments in the county, including um, health services agency, the Human Services Department, um, Public Defender, and County Council. Um, and the, again, the, the, it started last year, but with a few counties, it's going to be expanding greatly this December, and that's when it's going to take effect uh, in our county. SB 43 is another big uh, change in the law. It updates California's conservatorship laws for the first time in more than 50 years. Um, Californians experiencing serious mental illness or severe substance use disorder and are also at risk of to harm themselves can have a conservator appointed to direct their care. Um, SB 43 changes the definition of grave disability in two ways. The, the first and most significant is that it adds severe substance use disorder as a reason someone could be placed on an involuntary hold. That's brand new. In the past, it has to be severe mental health issue. It has now been expanded to be severe substance use disorder. Um, this will go into 
effect in January 2024 in two counties. Uh, other counties, almost every other county in the state has deferred it to 2026 and with, as, as our county. But it'll have a great impact, especially on our human services department. Um, again, public defender, um, health services agency, uh, county council, all of the, all of those departments are involved, uh, in these involuntary holds and it's significant expansion to include those with severe substance use disorder. Proposition one was approved in this uh, last ballot. This is uh, funds that are derived from the 1% tax on income above $1 million. Um, we receive um, more than $20 million. Uh, I think it was actually 26 or 27 million last year. Um, there's going to be the most significant part to us is that uh, proposition one requires that 30% of part of the behavioral health services fund from the mental health services act to be reallocated redirected from existing programs to housing intervention what I, what it means to us is initially we think it's going to be about six million dollars of our mhsa funds are going to now be directed from their existing uses which has been mainly used on preventive services for mental health and counseling services and then redirected to housing programs so uh, that is coming. Uh, we're still looking at the timing and how this is going to be implemented. Um, but that is going to be very challenging uh, for our county as well. Uh, the one, um, one good thing that Proposition 1 did is that it's going to issue bonds um, for $6.3 billion, $6.4 billion in new housing um, for permanent supportive housing. So we think that is a good thing. But the, the part about reallocating 30% of part of our budget is going to be very challenging um, to our county. <clears throat> now I'd like to look at some of the good things and new good news that we're, we have in our budget. Uh, we're about to open uh, 500 Westridge, uh, which is going to be the new South County Government Center. Um, this is actually going to house many departments, as you can see those listed. This is the former West Marine building, uh, over 116,000 square feet. Um, we're not only going to consolidate five different leases so this is uh, not only make sense makes sense from a service point of view this can be more convenient to people they only have to go to one place as opposed to five different lease spaces in watsonville this is also going to save us money long term we're actually buying a building as opposed to renting and long term we are actually going to save money so this is not going to cost us money long term in the long term, this is going to save the county money. We're going to go from renters to owners, and we're going to pay less long term. So this is a good thing financially, and it's a good thing from a service point of view, because not only are we going to have consolidation of where our service is provided, but we're also going to add more services to South County from here in North County. So there's going to be additional services from our auditor controller, our assessor, elections, ad commissioner, um, other new services that are going to be there provided more convenience to residents of that part of our county. And that will be, um, it's happening right now. The move is actually taking place as I speak. Supervisor Hernandez and I were there yesterday and watching the final touch up paint being added. Uh, departments are moving in. Uh, we're going to have um, a preliminary grand opening in early June. We're going to have a ribbon cutting official, but departments are actually starting to move in uh, right now as we are ending our leases with other five other uh, buildings. Uh, this is just an example of the in the uh, layout of uh, 500 Westridge or the South County Government Center. There's also a community room uh, in this building uh, that will be able to be used for public meetings and will be a great service to the county and other governments. Uh, Freedom Campus, we are, we've done a master plan and uh, this is um, a property in Watsonville. It's 10 acres. We occupy the front five acres, mostly with health services agency. Uh, although the ad commissioner will be moving from here to uh, 500 Westridge. Um, and you can see the back parcel is actually vacant at this point. Um, we have done a master plan for this. And the thought is, is that we are going to um, build at least one new building. Um, 
might be uh, 15,000 square feet. We've actually looked at a bigger building as well uh, that will provide our main thing, which will be a brand new health clinic. Our existing health clinic uh, is, has been remodeled. It's very small. It's cramped and it's just very old. And this would give us a brand new building as well as new office space for our public health staff uh, in Watsonville. Um, we also have talked to other jurisdictions, other public agencies about partnering with us. And so we're preliminary discussions with that. And then the idea is that on the back parcel, we would actually do an affordable housing workforce slash workforce housing project. It's five acres in the back that is unoccupied. That's just basically a parking lot at this point. And we are looking at possibly doing an affordable housing project. So we are progressing now on this project. We finished the master planning. We're getting ready to issue a request for qualifications uh, for uh, developers to help us come up with a master plan, come up with actual a uh, plan to implement this project. Uh, the crisis children's crisis stabilization program at 5300 SoCal Avenue is being developed. Uh, it'll be ready in approximately a year. It'll provide eight new beds for uh, children's crisis stabilization and then 16 beds for crisis residential program. Uh, this is very significant program for the whole region, not only our county. And it is now under development and will be developed, will be opening, we think, in about a year from now. We're also making uh, significant progress in many of our um, programs uh, for the unhoused population. Uh, we have three low barrier uh, navigation centers in development right now. The idea is that these are going to trend, folks are going to be helped to tr transition into permanent housing following our housing first principles. Uh, entry will be through referral and assessment. They will be very service rich environments. Uh, safe, staff 24-7, uh, and will help reduce population. Uh, Bridge housing site at 2202 Socal Avenue is 34 units, funded by 10.2 million state grant. Uh, we hope to open it in late 2024. Uh, Recurso de Fuerza, 118 First Street, Watsonville. Uh, we're doing this in partner with the city, partnership with the County of Monterey and the City of Watsonville. It's a great joint project, 34 units uh, funded uh, from an encampment resolution fund grant. Uh, we hope to open it late 2024 as well. And then we are working with the city of Santa Cruz and Housing Matters on Coral Street Navigation Centers at 125 Coral Street, uh, looking at 100 plus units in partnership, again, with those entities, uh, hoping uh, to get a grant to fund it in this next year. Uh, we also have a number of permanent supportive housing projects. Uh, Veterans Village in Ben Loman is 20, 20 units for veterans at risk of homelessness. We're hoping to working with uh, veterans uh, organization to hopefully open that in 2026. Casa Azul, 801 River Street, uh, worked with Housing Matters on that. That has opened seven units in the city of Santa Cruz and Park Haven Plaza in Soquel. 35 units for very low income veterans and youth exiting foster care, hopefully opening that in 2025. So with that, I'm going to present it, turn it over to um, budget manager uh, Marcus Pimentel for the presentation um, on more detail on the actual budget presentation. Thank you very much. Um, Good morning, Chair Cummings and board members. Um, after that profound moment, I want to just reflect on the what's included in the proposed budget. Uh, um, so before I step into navigating the budget, I just want to roll back again at the at the big level. Um, included in, the, in our proposed budget is a summary of Carlos Blasius's, um presentation. He just finished it summarized in his in his own budget message. We have sections on our economic outlook, sections on our financials, uh, summarizing our, our current finances as a county. We have in information about county services within each department's uh, budget page. There's information about the status and progress they're making on their operational plan objectives, as well as the detailed dis discussions of the, all their services within their divisions, within their departments, and the changes that are happening within the budget uh, by their services. And included in our budget is this digitized version is our interactive transparency portal that allows any member of the public to have access to 96 saved reports and 
public members can create as many other views that they want, modify the reports, change it from a general fund to all funds, change it from one department to another department, a drill down in, into department's line items. So it gives a lot of rich access with 96 saved reports that somebody can start with and then go from there and save URL, URLs under their own browser and have a whole section of their favorite budget pages that they can uh, navigate through. Um, today's opening of our budget hearing will continue the hearings to May 21st and 22nd when we conclude today's hearing and ultimately concluding the, the budget hearing cycle on June 4th. For the May 21st and 22nd hearings, you'll, you may receive some supplemental budget updates, typically things that, that we hear about coming out of the state budgets that will be informed by the May revise. You'll see those in supplemental budget actions or other federal or state funding changes. You might see those as supplemental budget actions that will be discussed by departments in their reports on May 21st and 22nd. So I want to jump into a little bit about how to navigate our, our digital budget version. Um, this year, we we spent some time thinking about the views and the accessing um, of the page, and we've looked to simplify and clean up some of the the noise and have a little bit more cleaner, elegant look of, of the budget site. And this is our third year of having a digital budget. Um, in addition to the digital budget, we have a, a and I'll work on the naming of budget and brief that's 271 pages and it will grow. Um, so eventually we're, we want to have a printable version of all the elements for a budget available in a, in a hard copy format. Um, navigating the budget site, it starts with uh, our proposed 2024-25 budget. There's two ways to start your navigation journey. Uh, you can hover your mouse or finger if you're on your phone over your the budget and it'll automatically open up sub menus that you can filter down and access different levels of information down to department pages mm. or you can use the, the new navigation bar that's on this on the left of every budget page that has quick links to if you to allow users to click down and see different information if it's a department page you can go down into their services at this introduction level you can click to get information about our economic outlook and more information about our, our summary Drilling down a little bit deeper into department pages, um, some new features that users will see is the ability to switch between budget years. So if somebody's on, you know, a particular the assessor's page, they can toggle back between this year's budget and last year's budget seamlessly to see what was in their proposed budget and the adopted budget from last year and see what the changes and when discussion items that were last year as compared to this year. Um, in addition to be able to scroll down and access all the information of a department's page or use the navigation bars for quick links to jump to their different sections within each department's pages. Um, drilling down further, if you scroll down a little bit further, drill down into the department services and objectives, there's really rich content that breaks up the department down into their divisions. In this case, I've used an example of health services to the behavior health divisions, clinic services, environmental health. And if you click on any, any one of those, it'll open up all the services that are within those divisions. And then clicking a particular service will drill down further into more information about the services and the changes that are happening within the services. Again, this level of information is available in our budget and brief document as well. This wanted to touch a little bit about our transparency portal. Um, this is the OpenGov solution that was brought forward a couple years ago. Um, this allows us to members of the public to have a, a visual view of the budget as well as classic financial tables. If you scroll down, you, it starts with the visual view of bar chart. And if you scroll down, you'll see the actual bar chart, the, the table of, of the financial numbers by sections. Um, all these reports are interactive. A user can click on a particular bar or click on the expenses or revenues on the side, and it'll open up and drill down into more information. Um, on the right side of the screen are examples um, of the various views, 96 different saved reports that, that a, uh, anybody in our community can click on any one of those, and it'll take them right to a particular section, typically information about departments, but also information on the county's discretionary general fund revenue. Or, you know, right now we have this, in this current budget, we have 222 million we're projecting available and discretionary revenue. That is our general fund county, county contribution that's available for departments. So there's a report uh, that, that details that as an example. And then finally, within the budget site, there's a lot more content rich information. There's information about the county's funding structure, budget structure, our budgeting principles, our fund balance policy, as well as a lot of more supplemental information, documents and schedules, including our budget and brief. Um, but also including information about 
uh, the one page summary of the county budget process when it begins and when it ends and describing each of those phases, a discussion or a review of the county's org chart and a listing of our current department heads, um, a schedule of all, all the core investments, a schedule of risk management funds. And this list will continue to grow. Um, and we have also on this list is our schedule of personnel. So you, that one, it starts with a one page summary of the county's personnel by department, and then it drills down into every uh, position within those departments. That information is available in the digital budget, but it's also available here as a PDF as a supplemental information. So let me uh, take you into what we're proposing into the our proposed 24-25 budget. Again, that will continue with the budget hearings that will have richer, deeper dives on May 21st and 22nd. Uh, this year's budget, as you just heard, is really impacted by the severity and the frequency of the, the natural disasters we're all facing seven in, in effectively seven years um, and, and the order of magnitude that we of the projects we can't get to is humbling and <laughs> concerning. In addition, the projects we have funded and paid for that we have to wait for reimbursement for years and years and years. So we're well, also, in addition to the budget hearings on May 14th, the kind of backstory, a lot of this is we'll have a deep dive conversation about the need to finance and issue debt for $85 million of capital debt. And as Carlos Palacios mentioned, we're issuing capital debt at a historic level to finance things that have already happened in the past because of cash flow issues and the delays in, in, in reimbursement. Um, this will severely limit our abilities, our county's ability to issue debt. Um, just to try to solve for some of the projects from 2017, some of the projects of 2023 storm disasters, and to try to finance the remaining elements of our 2020 CZU fires. So that's a, that's a profound thing to think about uh, that we'll be dis discussing on May 14th, in addition to all the budget hearings that are coming forward. Um, the notable items that you'll hear about in the changes in this proposed budget include implementing strategies, related to the Cal AIM and the care program and all the elements of the mandated services that we now must continue to adapt to that we're being um, driven to. Um, we're supporting the opening and the staffing of the South County Government Center um, and the going live with that, including you'll see some some references to the transition of, of 10 position um, from the Community Development Department to General Services Department to, to help and plan for all those moves. We're reducing the county staffing by 34.1, the full-time equivalent positions, reducing county staffing by 35, 34 positions, largely related to reduced funding, largely related to the reductions in COVID-related funding. Um, and most of that is in our health services department. They're facing 55 position reductions. They're adding 12.75, um, but we'll talk about that a little bit more and you'll have, have a deep, deeper conversation about that in, in the May 21st budget hearing for health services. Um, we've reduced the general fund contingency. So typically we propose budgets that have a funded 1% contingency for the general fund just to address unexpected issues and disasters because of what we've already experienced in unexpected disasters. We have to reduce that funding level down, down to only 1.5 million, which really limits our ability to be adaptive and, and responsive to needs that, that will come up throughout the entirety of next fiscal year. Um, we've unfunded all general fund capital projects because we must prioritize and figure out how to finance the ongoing debt service for projects that we will be discussing on May 14th, for projects that have already happened that we must finance for cash flow purposes. Um, and what this doesn't include is any anything out of the Measure K, March 5th ballot measure that is, you know, at the time of proposing this budget, the results weren't certified. Um, so that is not yet included in any of our proposals. You'll see us in our cash flow modeling when we're projecting our cash flow in out years. We're including that from a cash flow modeling perspective, but it's not in our budget. It's not in our proposed budget. <laughs> On the whole, our proposed 24-25 budget is a reduction of $161 million from the adopted budget from last year. Uh, typically, we've been seeing incremental growth in our budget this year for a lot of different reasons. Um, that growth isn't there largely out of capital projects. Typically we might be funding a lot of new projects, especially road projects, special district projects. But this year's funding is, uh, you know, out years funding of projects are really going to shifting to, to finance and fund existing projects that are already happening now. Um, so that's a large explanation of our big reduction in, in our budget at a countywide level. Um,
when drilling down from the all funds budget of looking at our budget by funds, looking grouping it by type, so salaries and employee benefits, we are seeing an increase of 23 million. That's the ongoing cost to, to maintain staffing across the entire county. A lot of this is special district, um, county service area, um, enterprise funded staff, but also some general fund staffing. So you'll see a smaller number when we get to the general fund um, coming up in a few slides. Again, we have not yet factored in Measure K's revenue into this amount, nor have we factored in an increase in debt service yet that would come out of the actions on May 14th. So these budget numbers will still change um, based on what's happening at the state with supplemental revenue with our supplemental budget changes and additional action on May 14th that will then drive what the final budget might look like. Looking at our total, so you've seen our the last two slides showed our total budget by fund, then our total budget by service type, by uh, uh, category type. Now looking at our uh, budget based on governmental categories, general government, health and human services, you can see the allocation that most of our budget is being directed towards health and human services and public safety and justice. Um, on the right side are our proposed staffing changes. So we, we generally are seeing a reduction of 34.1 positions across the entire county. And I'll summarize that in this schedule. Um, beginning from the top, this is a schedule of all positions across the county. Our proposed budget would end up with 277, 2,774.56 positions, so top right. And that yellow column is the proposed budget changes. We're reducing our, our county staffing by 34.1. Within general government, it's an increase of 12 positions, but that's reflecting more of a transfer in of 10 positions from land use and community services into general government. Um, we are also adding an assessor um, to the assessor recorder and adding a service uh, fiscal officer to general services. Within health and human services, the big change is the health services agency, a net reduction of 42.35 positions. Again, they'll discuss that in a deeper dive on May 21st in the budget hearings. And we're unfunding uh, one position in child support services. Within cannabis or within land use and community services, we are reducing one position in cannabis. I think we've talked about over the last several years, the reduced expectations in cannabis revenue and the flatlining of our annual uh, cannabis revenue coming in. The program is being decreased a little bit in its scope and, and that allows us to reduce one position so we can keep it um, the county financially solvent. Within community development and infrastructure, that's a big department now. It's both planning and Department of Public Works and within Public Works are or road project type activities, as well as a lot of special district activities. There's a net reduction of 7.75 positions that reflects uh, moving 10 positions from uh, Department of Public Works into general services, uh, but also adding 2.25 positions for solid waste and um, uh, sanitation district funds. Parks and open services, we're adding, proposing to add one position that would be funded in the future through uh, the RTC's funding stream for the further wealth Wealth program, um, and then in public safety and justice, there's three positions being converted for the public defender from contracted positions to in-house staffing, being funded through medical, uh, Medicare administrative um, health reimbursements, the MAW program, as well as the sheriff corner is adding two positions for the DNA lab that are funded externally. So, with the storyline in all this is you're seeing a reduction in workforce because of a reduction in revenues, as well as the only changes we're able to add to staffing are where there is funding sources to support the adding of those staff. Um, we are unable to absorb the new general fund resources to current staff, to new staffing. So all these position ads are already externally funded and things we're moving towards, but we've been very limited in our ability to respond to all the different service demands that departments have asked for and, and asked to meet. Moving from the all funds down into the general fund, I mean, most of our time and efforts are spent in a general fund budget, a $754 million general fund budget. Um, this chart shows on the line our expenditures from the actuals for 22-23 compared to the adopted budget, compared to our estimated actuals as compared to the proposed budget, ending up at 754.2 million as compared to the bar chart of revenues. Um, we often find and, and, and continue to see uh, the, the need to keep talking about our systematically unfunded status of our county and the fact that our entire general fund relies on total tax revenue, 183 million. 
So it's, we're really relying on other federal and state and charges for services to maintain our, our, our funded operations across the entire general fund. Um, within those uh, $183 million in total taxes, um, there's a there's about another $40 million of other charges for service of interest earnings. Uh, our inter investment portfolios is seeing an increase in our investment portfolio. And there are other things that are driving um, our up to a $222 million total discretionary general fund. That's the amount that we calculate based on general tax revenue and general um, other revenue sources that are, again, are interest earnings, um, and charges for services for the general fund that were available to, to finance changes in the general fund budget. Um, we're very limited in our ability to adapt to the increased cost pressures. If I'm looking at the general fund by its different um, uh, types of costs, salary and benefits are going up 9.8 million. And you saw a larger number across the entire county of about 23 million within the general fund, 9.8 million, largely through contract contractual obligations for salary and healthcare benefits. But across all the other categories, we're seeing reductions in costs, largely related to the elimination of capital funding, largely related to um, reductions in services due to decreased funding sources. So our general fund budget is actually decreasing this year by $12 million where it stood last year and the adopted budget is 766 million. Again, unfunded all capital projects. Last year we had 5 million of funding for, for new capital projects. This year we have zero. Um, we've reduced our general fund contingency down to 1.5 million. Last year we had about 7 million. So we're just having to make continued reductions to try to accommodate our reduced funding level. And despite that, we're still relying on about 6.3 million of uh, current, this year's current, general fund carryover that would flow into next year to help help solve for the budget. And the all funds or the expenditure budget assumes total uh, budget authority. We expect that at the end of the year, we will have spent less than 754 million by the end of next year. But right now that is our current projection for our budget of 754 million. It's financed through revenues of 747 million. Again, there's a delta of about 6.3 million that will be carried over from this year. Uh, within the county's revenues, our top four general purpose tax uh, revenues are, are property tax at $83 million, uh, vehicle license fees at $44.8 million, sales tax at $25.9 million, and transit occupancy tax at $14.2 million. Again, the, the $25.9 million in sales tax does not include anything from Measure K at this point in time. On the whole, across the entire tax category, we're seeing about a $3.5 million projected increase. Um, largely driven through an increase in property tax growth of 2.3 million um, or 3.5 million and a vehicle license growth of 2.3 million. We do have a reduction in some of our other tax categories. Um, so we're, 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 we're still projecting about a $3.6 million net increase in total tax revenues. Within our use of money and property, that is going up by 8.26 million. Um, almost all of it is attributed to a, a increased performance in our county's investment for portfolio that is seeing a, a, an increase with investment rate earnings. And we're thankful for that. That's helped us solve for some of the gap that we would have had in our budget. Um, this is a similar chart to what you saw February 13th when we presented the mid-year report. This is a revised cash flow forecast. Again, not necessarily budget, but what we expect to actually happen in the out years with salary savings, with um, uh, new revenue sources that might be might be plausible. So, in this cash flow model, I have included uh, the ten million dollars and twenty five twenty six from Measure K, the out year that we're talking about. I have included that in this cash flow model, and we're still facing a projected deficit of about eight point nine million in our out year twenty five twenty six. This Current proposed budget is balanced per out year, but still have a, a gap of about $9 million. That grows to $22.8 million and then starts to, to, to narrow down. And some of that is a natural cost increase that we've been projecting out for the for the late 2020s, um, ending with about a $2.8 million uh, projected structural gap by 2030, 2031. This is based on what we believe to be credible, credible cash flow, credible savings and total operations. Um, but is being driven by our need to finance. We're projecting about a five and a half million dollar annualized new debt service that we're going to have to absorb that will come out of our May 14th budget hearings. The total 
if we add, add it up in one year, the total drip service, it'll probably be closer to seven to eight million. But what we expect is the annualized carrying amount of 5.5 million with the ability of some federal reimbursements coming in to reduce that those out year service gaps. We've also had to increase for some of the service change and, and diversions of revenue in the state mandates of the discussion that our CEO Palacios uh, talked about. So again, where our cash flow is, is still projecting some work that we need to work towards to solving out your gaps. But the good news is it's it's shrinking in, in our in our out structural gaps. Um, so hopefully by 2032, we'll be here talking about some better news and better times. Uh, this is a slide we talked a little bit about. So different from the systematic underfunding is, is there are other changes happening that are eroding some of our revenue within sales tax, the modernization, the digitization of purchasing things, converting um, tangible purchases to services. There's a lot happening and what used to be sales tax base is now converting to services or that traditional sales tax base is shrinking because of state changes and how online sales tax is allocated. So things that, are, that a consumer is buying if they live in Live Oak or if they live in Felton or they live in Corlitas, um, those consumers are buying things online. And typically that sales tax is not coming back to the county. It's, it's going either to other cities or to other counties where um, distribution centers are located. So that's an unfortunate outcome of the change and uh, of the consumer's behavior of buying a lot more online and where the importance of having brick and mortar, local brick and mortar is still very valuable because anything purchased at a brick and mortar stays in this county. But a lot of the online purchases, we're, we're projecting about $5 million a year that the general fund is losing in sales tax is going to, to other places when it's purchased online. The good news is on the locally voter approved special district taxes, that's what's Measure K is referred to legally as a special district tax. Um, those solve for some of this problems. So those, those special districts have a different allocation formula by the state. So when it's a special add-on tax, um, much of that revenue will stay here. So that's a, it's an interesting nuance with the base sales tax and any locally approved taxes. The locally approved taxes keep about 80% of that revenue will stay here. So we're lo only losing a small fraction on 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 locally approved sales taxes but it's still accounting uh, to about five million a year of general fund revenues that would have been here let's say 10 years ago that we don't see now from our reserves perspective our reserve as a percent of our general fund has increased slightly to ten and a half percent 79.4 million but it still relies on 40 million dollars of health care funding that otherwise could be used for things like the freedom campus project that you talked about and, and may need to be used for that um, and even at a $79 million, 10%, 10.5% funded level, uh, that's, that's, that wouldn't be enough to finance $85 million that we may be needing in our discussions on May 14th. So our reserves are good and strong, and, and it's what's led to some of our AAA bond rating. Um, but it, it, it is not sufficient for a lot of reasons, and especially in the state of our current recurring natural disasters. So just finishing in conclusion, getting to um, where we're at in their budget cycle. Today is April 9th. Uh, our budget was released and published online on April 2nd. A press release went out uh, last week, and, and so today kicks off our budget hearing season. May 21st and 22nd are the next budget hearings, two days of full budget hearings. Um, you'll have Carlos Palacios, the CEO, and myself opening up the hearings on May 21st, and then you'll have each um, major department presenting a summary of their budget, and there'll be a lot more uh, content available within the within the agenda reports all leading to um, actions on june 4th to approve the proposed budget to um, include last day actions as well as concluding actions to the controller to close out this current year and any budget changes that are required to leading towards the adoption of the budget on september 24th two more slides we're almost there just there's a lot more imminent challenges that we're facing and, and, and certainly a lot of successes and achievements that we've had as a county. Um, but it's, it's worth repeating the 73 billion budget deficit that we're, we're monitoring closely, trying to understand what proposals does the state may add on to that will impact our county operations. We're eager to, to learn about those and understand what that impact is. Um, again, May 14th, we've talked a lot about that. It's, it's really coloring a lot of our outlook. Um, how, we, how we can come up to cash flowing prior disasters that we have to wait years for federal reimbursement. We're projecting about 85 million will be required and we're talking about, we'll be talking about on May 14th. How do we adapt to the new normal recurring natural disasters and the financing of projects and, and, and working with our federal partners about, um, they've been 
many of our federal partners understand the challenges with the current system. Um, we appreciate the effort of, of, of this board and their leadership, as well as the state of California and their leadership of working with us and how they we might partner together to to solve for some of these issues. Um, in addition to many of our mandated services and, and that keep rolling down to our county, again, our county has mandated services we must provide in addition to all the municipal services to over half the population. And then that just leads to how do we deal with the continual systematic underfunding of our of our unique county and our inability to address all of our aging infrastructure, all the aging uh, facilities and the ongoing damages to our in infrastructures. Um, again, we have good reserves, but they're just not sufficient enough to allow us to tap into to help with, with the disaster funding we're, we're facing. So with that, that concludes my report. We're certainly available for conversations, discussions, um, and those conversations, I should say, will continue more richer, deeper dives on May 21st and 22nd. Great, thank, thank you so much for that in-depth presentation. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up to the community to see if there's any member of the public who would like to comment on the uh, budget presentation that we just received. If you would like to comment and you're here in the audience, please step up to the podium. Thank you. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner. Thank you for this uh, preview of what is coming. It's not, not all that good news, but I appreciate the heads up. Um, I noticed that there is no discussion at all about the county's unfunded CalPERS liability. In past discussions like this in, in previous years, that was a big piece of the discussion and a very dire uh, warning about a huge unfunded CalPERS liability for the county. It's not even discussed here, so that concerns me. It comports with uh, what was presented by Mr. Palacios in those reports discussing the unfunded CalPERS. It comports with the dates, uh, years that uh, the debt 26-27 will be especially high. Uh, 22.8 million is what I saw on that graph in Mr. Pimentel's discussion. So please talk about this. It is a big piece. Um, I did, I, I request that the county invest in uh, infrastructure that repairs and maintains what we have rather than spending millions of dollars on new projects. The the Westridge project is going to be very nice, but I don't think we could. We really can't afford that. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry that it happened. Actually, it will be nice, but a lot of things are nice. But if you can't afford them, you shouldn't do them. And and I think that's one case in point. Um, there are many others. So. I did look at the database website and it is much more user friendly. Thank you for those improvements. I look forward to uh, the opportunity to see more detailed information as those documents are added. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody here in person who'd like to speak to us on this item, please come up to the podium. Yeah, hello again. And um, I think, um, it's my imagination that it was a um, report from Mr. Palacios, like uh, unsuccessful report that he cannot get as much money as this county needed. And um, I'm going to talk about the illegals, Do you know, in this county that became priority for this county, not citizens, not uh, permanent residents, but undocumented aliens. Excuse me, how does this relate to the budget? Uh, because the money goes from who? To support undocumented aliens. I think the money coming from budget. And it is a lot of work put into the immigration project. And when I came again to get assistance to my daughter, who is a permanent resident, we live here almost in United States, almost 30 years. And what that office does, just does everything that my daughter will not get the citizenship. So this is just uh, unbelievable what is going on, what kind of uh, intrigues and whatever, how they concentrate on one person that was made sick because my daughter was not sick. 
do you know she had just traumatic brain injury but she became sick mentally sick as soon as the mental health department stole my daughter from me and now they're trying to make me sick because i cannot get assistance i cannot get help every day is a like a crisis you know every single day so i have to lose my appetite my sleep everything just to take care of my daughter who was destroyed by this county and this should be priority of this county to take care of negativity you know people who complain against the negative um, practices is really care about this county and not the people who hide it thank you so much is there any other member of the public here in person who'd like to speak to us on this item? Okay, seeing none, is there anyone online who'd like to speak to us on the budget? Yes, Chair, we do have speakers. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Aaron, I'm Garrett. Thanks for the extensive, though dire, report <laughs> on the budget. And where the heck is our tax money going? Um, and over half of it goes to all these wars and right away money for Ukraine and is slaughtering people with genocide in Palestine. That's our tax money being siphoned out of the counties and cities that could be used for needed services. I think of that bumper sticker I used to have when I was teaching, it will be a great day when the schools have all the money they need. And the Air Force has to have a bake sale to buy a bomber. And we could say it'll be a great day when we have money for homes and parks and employment, et cetera. And I have a quote here from Martin Luther King Jr. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on war than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. I, and then I've referred a number of times, and I want you to check geoengineeringwatch.org and the dimming film they have on that website. You talked just now about natural disasters. How much of this is natural and how much of it is from geoengineering by uh, Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, et cetera. Uh, anyway, and the last point is- Thank you so much. Kathy, your microphone's now available. Hello, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation today. My name's Kathy Lass, I live in Aptos. And I was um, curious about understanding more about the process for the public input. So I've heard today that there'll be a May 14th meeting. I'm not sure if that's a supervisor's meeting. Um, I've heard about the May 21st and um, 22nd hearings. Um, I was wondering where, if there was opportunity for having town hall meetings or conversations locally or other opportunities to have conversations and to get questions answered so that the public can have more input. If there is some um, documentation on the website, um, I, I couldn't find it. So if that could be highlighted, that would be great too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bernie, your microphone's now available. Yeah, once again, thank you. Uh... And I do want to thank uh, Mr. Palacios and Pimentel for the presentation and also acknowledge the friendly user uh, portal right for this budget. Um, and I now I understand why it's uh, it's been recognized, you know, as a, a, a top notch, right? Uh, so my comment is going to be around the uh, amount we're spending right on corrections. Right, I know um, hopefully we'll get more detailed information when the 21st, 22nd budget hearings come across. But I do want to flag that currently we are spending $45 million on corrections, right? Um, 
to house, to incarcerate a daily average population of 355 individuals, right, men and women. Um, $21 million alone in the jail, that is about, you know, that has a lot of empty beds, right? Um, so what I really want this board to start thinking about is like, how do we decommission some of these empty beds, right? Some of these, uh, the, uh, yeah, some of these beds that are, that are basically uh, uh, taking money from the county, right? How can we uh, restructure right and reinvest some of this uh some of this money into things that we actually need you know um there is round tree right there is a it has a new facility but it has a lot of empty beds so i'm really thinking about how much money can uh the county save and how much more cost effective can we provide uh, um, services to the community, right? That actually uh, will target recidivism and stuff. So looking forward to these uh, conversations and uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Reggie, your microphone's now available. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. <clears throat> thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanna echo what uh, Bernie just said and sort of, uh, when I look at the budget um, on the website, which again, yeah, was a very nice website, laid it out very clearly, uh, even in relative detail. The things that pop up to me are the lack of equity, right? Our district attorney hires more lawyers and staff than the public defenders. Um, I see that our uh, jail uh, spends an awful lot of money and when you calculate per person cost of incarcerating someone, it's about 106,000 a year. But if we paid the median rent for a one bedroom market rate apartment and paid for someone's tuition to Cabrillo and all of their food and gas, that is $30,000 a year less than putting them in main jail right now. So what are we doing, right? We're, we're so punitive. And it's so ineffective with the 60% recidivism rate in Maine jail right now. Um, I would just like us to like think about, and we're making, we're making efforts. Like I think the neighborhood court program is good. I think we're making Roundtree is good, though again, it's not really used. So I think, and uh, the reduction in population in the juvenile hall is very good. But I think we need to lean more into that because it saves money. It's good for people. It'll reduce our ongoing costs and it'll just make our uh, community just a healthier, safer place. Because a lot of these crimes are just crimes of poverty. They're not um, something you can just punish people out of doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Tim, your microphone's now available. Thank you for allowing me to speak again. Uh, sadly, I mean, the crimes of poverty stuff, I don't totally agree with. No way. When I was a young man, I had a personal friend of mine that was about 19 years of age, murder another friend of mine that was 15. And it was brutal what the guy did to him. Uh, I remind you that these, these comments should be directed to the budget. So, so anyways, in regards to the budget, uh, I'm not really for the concepts of defund police and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, so that's a concern. Um, one thing that could be done to help out the budget, though, a little bit is when you hear this concept of President Biden paying off everyone's student loans or, you know, a lot of folks that have these huge student loans and whatnot. Folks did not do that for me. Okay. Mr. I had Richards, a Pell Grant. Ms. Mr. Richards, could you please direct it to the county's budget? My name which is, is what we're discussing. Okay. And my um, apologies. So the way you could save money is by having these students that are taking this federal money and just having their student loans paid off, they could do things for the community. Just like I mentioned to you about making the Ben Lamone or the Demio Lane garbage facility available during the weekends so homeowners can remove their things and so people could pick up trash on your roads and whatnot that might be able to reduce costs to the county and just think about the concepts you could be driving on a road here without seeing all this trash 
and horrible stuff flow into your rivers and into your ocean and everything. It creates a gooey, toxic mess, and it destroys our county, and it's quite depressing to look like to look at, okay? So, um, and in regards to the war stuff, sorry, folks, you know, there's no cost too high for freedom. I'm sorry on that one, all right? We, we can't let Russia walk all over us and bring on additional costs to, the, to our county, okay? So those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pam, your microphone's now available. Hi. Yeah, I want to thank you, um, as others have, for for the presentation. Um, I I got pulled away, and I'm going to watch it again because um, because I missed pieces of it. But um, but I think it's this is so important this conversation and the budget really reflects our priorities, our values. And I, I really appreciate the time that's gone into making it accessible and, um, and understandable. And um, it was mentioned the neighborhood courts program, which for the past nine months, 10 months, I've been a volunteer in. And um, my experience has highlighted this need to shift to um, from the punitive and carceral to um, restorative justice to healing programs. Um, I'm I'm really impressed with with this program, and I know there's a lot of other ones that the public defender's office is is um, carrying out. And I, I'll say it about the presentation that you made. I was, I was horrified by the incredible um, cuts to health and human services, and and then we're increasing the sheriff's office. Um, we have the average thirty um, percent of our jails right now are empty beds. So we can reduce in that department, and it's it's an opportunity to invest where where we know we can we can make changes so that people stay out of jail and and don't keep cycling through. And equity, equity, equity. Thank you. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I'll bring it back to the board to see if there's any questions, comments, and if any action needs to be taken. And I'll start with Supervisor Brown. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. I had a just a brief question. And the general fund contingencies are uh, alarmingly low, uh, with a hope that it's temporary. But can you just maybe, for the board's understanding, briefly, Mr. Pimentel, just explain what that reduction in contingencies could potentially do, or what risks we might be facing as a result of that. Um, and as an example, in last year's budget, early on, we it, it, last year mid year we we appropriated about 1.6 million from contingencies for then the 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 New Year's Eve night storm disaster that we experienced. So that's greater than the 1.5 million we're at now. So that would be problematic. You know, should we have another event? In the past, we've also had um, uh, other other. Things that pop up during the years, claims, lawsuits, bigger than we expected that we've we've had to address with contingencies. Okay. I mean, the picture is is bleak, and that is separate from the great work that staff continues to do. With, I mean, if you look back from two thousand eight to now, I mean, planning department and public works were about half the staff that they had then. Parks is about a third, I think, less from what they had. Uh, then, but there has been, you know, a number of improvements that the county's made in in general services uh, to the broader community. I think that future boards, in particular, if you what you, the the way that the budget looks now for for the next say five to ten years, it relies on expectations that the situation remain relatively constant. And I think the one thing we know isn't going to happen is is that. So. It's bleak under the current circumstance. If we face the additional climate disasters, if the state continues additional unfunded mandates or realignments through things like Prop 1, if the state's budget and half of what the county functionally does are state and 
federal pass-throughs continues to require additional responsibilities without additional funding, I think that future boards are going to be faced with some very uh, challenging dis decisions in ways that they really haven't in the last 15 years. So the question I'd have, at least maybe for you, Mr. Palacios, kind of briefly would be, what three actions would you like to see their future boards, this or future boards take, and or what are the sort of the three key things that you think that needs to happen to break us out of the cycle? Because everything that was talked about today from debt servicing, et cetera, that's just, these are band-aids to a greater, more systemic issue. So in order to break out of the cycle and start looking at where there's future presentations that are more hopeful, what would you suggest would be the three kind of key drivers? Uh, thank you, uh, Supervisor Friend. Um, first and foremost, there needs to be reform nationwide and statewide over how we are responding to help local jurisdictions respond to natural disasters. Um, FEMA has been a great partner over the years in many ways, but they have an outdated formula for how they respond to natural disasters. They're taking anywhere from three to seven years to reimburse us. Um, they don't have enough money. They don't have enough staffing. They are working on a pre-climate change kind of model. And yet you look across the country and you see all the disasters that have happened and continue to happen from tornadoes, hurricanes. Um, who would have thought we would have had the devastating fires in Maui? Uh, what we need is reform at the FEMA level to make them uh, reimbursed more quickly and more efficiently. That's very significant. And then at the state level, I think there are advances that Cal OES could make to help local jurisdictions like ours to advance funds so that when we spend money responding to emergencies, they advance us and then they get the reimbursement. We're not asking for a grant from Cal OES, asking for advances. So I think local jurisdictions across the state are going to need that kind of cash flow assistance. And I think if we had those two things, a big chunk of our problem would go away right now. So, but they're not there yet because again, we're working off outdated models from prior to the great severity and frequency of natural disasters uh, we are currently experiencing. The second thing is that counties and cities, especially counties, but cities too, are going to have to get more aggressive again at uh, making claims under state mandate law. For under Jerry Brown, Brown many uh, state mandates went away or they were funded. And so we got complacent. Uh, we actually did pretty well under Governor Brown and locally. And if you remember, we used to get SB90 money for our state mandates, and it would be you know a few million dollars. That was extra revenue for us. Those mandates have not been funded for many years, and there's new mandates being added by the current administration. So uh, counties and cities have fallen asleep because they're just staff lack of institutional memory. Lack of practice. We haven't been going to state mandate um, commission. We need to get much more assertive at doing that. And so I think that is going to happen. And um, I think um, we're part of CSAC's. Um, in fact, Mr. Payment tells on the statewide committee. I know, um, Supervisor Friend, you've been at the state advocating that for uh, CSAC at the statewide level. So we need to keep pushing for that because that would help us with all of these unfunded mandates we have. And then um, third thing I think that uh, we're going to have to do, and it is actually difficult right now because we're in a bridge period. We There was a discussion about CalPERS and the unfunded liability. And actually, it is difficult still. We're still in a bit difficult position in some ways. But on the other hand, we've made significant progress in reducing our unfunded liability. First of all, this board many years ago, Passed a second tier, 2% at 60, that reduced our fund funded liability significantly. And then there was statewide pension reform in which a big significant portion of our county employees are under the statewide pension reform right now. And so if you look at the models, our costs are going to continue to increase uh, somewhat for the next 10 years. Um, we issued this board, authorized us to issue pension obligation bonds, which also reduced that unfunded liability that we have. Uh, but the good news is that after about 10 years, costs stabilize, and then they actually start dropping very dramatically um, within the 10 to 15 year period. 
So it is going to be um, somewhat difficult for the next few years in terms of getting through that. But in a future board, a decade from now, is going to have a huge windfall, actually, in those those funds that we're now dedicating to PERS. And so I think that is a good news thing, and it's going to be very important for this board as we get closer to those days is still a way is going to have to start planning how do you spend that money in terms of you know the most crit critical services we can provide um, to our community. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, just, I appreciate it to my three colleagues that have the, the honor of continuing on in this role. This is going to be a, a real challenge. I mean, this uh, when Supervisor McPherson and I got on, we were coming still out of the a 2008 Great Recession, and there was still cuts, and we didn't even have a Parks Department at the time. And and it's and there isn't that knowledge of there haven't really been a lot of electeds when you look at the city councils and you look at the board that have been through the level of cuts or, or if not cuts, the inability to make investments that I think that the the next two boards are going to face. And so, um, you know that, it, but it's going to be in your in your hands to really find ways to still provide the essential services while recognizing that that you don't want to destabilize the county moving forward. It's going to be a very uh, large challenge. But thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to ask the questions. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. You have any questions or comments? Uh, first, I have to say that uh, I agree with some of the public comments about you know. Uh, viewing this budget through the lens of equity and really le lean in on that equity. And of course, the public defender's office and is, uh, needs to be funded, of course, and more restorative, uh, justice programs. But, um, I think both of you guys mentioned it, but didn't kind of, uh, talk too much about it. But how's that $70 billion state deficit going to affect us to sort of a overview or bird's eye view of how it's going to affect our general fund and county services. So far, it's been modest, uh, not to say that the impacts are not important and, and severe a CalWORKs program that I think you've already heard about from the public and from our health uh, human services department. You'll hear more about that um, May 21st for our health and human services day, the budget hearings. Um, saw about a $300,000 hit to the public defender um, that fortunately they were able to balance through some offsetting revenues through increased uh, mall revenues. Um, but that was an unfortunate uh, discontinuation of funding for the public defender. There are a lot of proposals, excuse me, that are still out there. Uh, the governor largely uh, is proposing solutions that are one-time fixes that would um, may not impact us as severely, but that's still there's still a lot happening at the committee level across all committees in the state of California. So we're still trying to understand and be ready to respond to any new threats that emerge in the coming weeks. One thing I would mention and is that uh, counties have been and cities have been un united in asking for stable, um, adequate funding for our homeless um, services programs. There's a lot of one-time grants. You'll hear about this during the presentation from the Human Services Department and the Housing for Health Department. And um, there's so many different grants, all with different requirements, and all are one-time. And what we really need is stable, ongoing funding to, to fund these programs. For example, we have three um, low barrier navigation centers that are funded, would each be funded for about two years. And after that, there's no guarantee. Now there is some CalAIM funding that could be used to offset some of those costs, but uh, long-term, that is another big need. That's a huge issue for us as our community, the, the unhoused population and providing service for them. So to the extent that we could get ongoing stable funding for our homeless services programs, that would be a big priority. Uh, unfortunately, the state budget is making that very difficult right now. So that's another thing that is something we need that's unlikely to happen right now. And it's it's going to really depend on what happens a few years from now when the funding runs out for these navigation centers and um, it, what the economy is like at that time. Does that conclude your comments? Supervisor McPherson, do you have any comments? Yeah, thank you. I'm, I have have some extensive comments, and I just appreciate uh, Supervisor Friend's uh, forewarning of what, what's coming and what needs to be done to correct the situation that, that we're in from getting worse. Um, basically, uh, through no fault of the county itself, we are in a, a world of uh, disaster-related budgetary hurt in Santa Cruz County. Others are too, but 
I do appreciate, and I think it can't be overstated about the uh, award-winning online budget presentation that you've made at this point. It really gives a good picture and understand how government works and what we need to do. And I, I really thank you for the online budgeting uh, practice that you've put in place to let more people in our community uh, better understand what a budgetary crisis we're in in Santa Cruz County. Um, but this year, the budget story is grim. Um, the money owed to the county by the federal agencies and disaster response, which has been addressed by uh, CAO Carlos Palacios uh, for future concerns, is, uh, ser is just compromising our ability to make needed repairs and provide the services that we really want to do in Santa Cruz County. Um, we shouldn't be put in this position, uh, and the federal disaster support is something that we should be able to count on. But uh, there's been disasters throughout the nation, and I know that uh, that has created a, a national crisis itself. But as we learned, this problem is one that many local governments are facing because of the climate change disasters that have escalated across the country. Um, and I'm glad to see our general fund reserves maintain at slightly above 10%. Uh, that's something that uh, certainly I and other members of the board 12 years ago, when I came on, they said, let's get it at 12% and, or 10, 10%, and thank heavens we did. But it, it should be noted, too, that um, without health-specific uh, reserves, we are really closer to 5%, I guess, is the way I read it. And we, that, it's only two and a half payroll cycles. That's really concerning, uh, and that's... Um, we need to see how we can uh, increase that as best to our ability. But borrowing um, what, $85 million to keep the county service stabilized would not be feasible without that strong fiscal management that uh, we have been following for the past several 10 years for more than a decade. And thanks to all those who um, got us in as good a position as possible under the circumstances that we're facing today. Um, and this is going to be a budget cycle, uh, the last one of my tenure on the board. And I want to thank our, you, uh, Mr. Palacios, and you, Mr. Pimentel, uh, for all the staff that have contributed to this plan and, and of course, the action we've taken. Um, we've, we've, we're doing some good things. I, I would argue, no, let's do some things that need to be done. And I think it really does address the equity issue in particular. And I think we should, and I'm glad we have gone ahead and purchased uh, the West Ridge building that we're going to have five departments to serve the public better. That's going to be needed. It's needed today and it's going to be needed in the future. And we had the opportunity to do it and we did it. And I think it's a good thing that we've done. The same thing with the health clinic on the Freedom Boulevard. The Children's uh, Stabilization Center on SoCal Avenue, the Navigation Centers in Watsonville, Mid-County, and Santa Cruz. These are crises of their own that we need to address, and I think we're doing it to the best of our ability that we can. And I think it's forward-looking. Uh, we, we have a financial crisis, but I think we need to address what we're going to need and what we can afford now to address the problems uh, that are upon us today and certainly are uh, unfortunately going to be in the in the future um but the what the state is doing i've been cr crying this uh concern for a long time these unfunded mandates and the and when governor brown turned it around it was great and i wish we could stick with that and if there's some message that we should give to csac uh is that let's and they are addressing this Let's state people, you legislators, I know you want to do better by anybody, but if you want to do it for the counties, find out a way to pay for it because we are we can't do it at this point. And we're not the only county in this situation. We've got 57 others that are fa facing a similar crisis. So to the, I don't like to, excuse the pun, ask the buck to the state and federal governments but don't put more financial burden on the counties for programs that are needed, that are identified, but we cannot afford at this time. On the other hand, I'm really happy that we have gone ahead and had the forward looking, uh, been looking forward to the programs that we've implemented, especially in the South County. 
that's going to serve the citizens of Santa Cruz County better. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. I'll start with a few questions. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into more detail with the, with the budget hearings uh, in May. But uh, the first question is, is there any, do you have any specificity on what capital projects in uh, particular were unfunding in this budget year that, that were funded or that we were anticipating doing in previous years? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, on May, I think 22nd is capital project presentation day. So we'll have a discussion about more detail about those projects. An example that stands out to me is our uh, ad commissioner have a property um, uh, just off Capitol Avenue in Soquel that a portion of the warehouse is being eroded from a slide that's happening in the creek. And so there, there's a risk of, of losing our uh, a portion of our county building there. There's also some damages on the roof, uh, leak, leaks in the roof that we can't get to that we know about. And we're trying to do band-aids to fix it. Those are examples. We have a lot of the word aging facilities Aging carries a lot of weight in that in those two words. We really have a problem with our aging facilities across the entire county. We've been unable, um, like most counties, most cities over the last 20 years, following the Great Recession, have, have had to limit our ability to fund um, local facility projects because there's more important service needs that are out there. So I think we'll have a richer conversation um, coming on April 22nd on that. Got it. And then um, to follow that up a little bit to this point of investing in our infrastructure. So in the general fund out year forecast, the 26, 27 budget, there's a $12 million deficit, which is that's sort of the gray part of the bar. And I think that's mostly uh, because we're going to have to invest uh, in county infrastructure. And then the next year has an $8.1 million deficit. Um, are those like particularly urgent projects that need to be addressed in those budget years? I'm just wondering why they fall then. Um, and I mean, presumably we're going to have to figure out how to pay for them in those years, right? Uh, right now, those are not, we're not projecting specific projects. We're just mm -hmm. noting that um, going probably over the last five years, we've averaged about 2 million a year in facility investments. That, that's got to change. So we're trying to figure out how we can program in the need to maintain our facilities at their current conditions. Because we all know this, when a facility fails, they start seeing degradation like at the Ag Commissioners. The cost to fix a leaking roof is ex Exponentially greater than just doing a uh, a maintenance on the roof to, to allow it so it doesn't leak. Mm -hmm. So we're just those forecasts are including presumptions that we need to start increasing our investment capacity, but there's not projects yet identified in those out years. Got it. Got it. Um, all right, well, I guess I'll build off of uh, Supervisor Friend's comments a little bit. I mean, it does seem like we are, are facing unprecedented challenges here, um, and what's being presented to us is a status quo budget. And I, I do question if we can really maintain the status quo at this point. I mean, what, what, and I feel like to some extent, you know, I appreciate your, your responses, CAO Palacios about, um, you know, things that need to change, uh, the way the state and federal governments fund disasters, um, the unfunded mandates, um, you know, ultimately sort of waiting out this pension reform issue. Uh, but I mean, the question, I, I think still hangs. What can this board do in this budget cycle to improve our position? And I think fundamentally we have to lean into the revenue side a little bit more. I mean, um, I, things that I would like to see funded in this year's budget included GIS tech, uh, a new um, senior plans examiner. I mean, the folks who are going to assess property, help us get uh, new APN set, uh, help us to build and get us out of the housing crisis because that's ultimately going to support the bottom line of more property taxes for this community, which will support more social services as well. Uh, you know, then there is this question of, of infrastructure and, and principally roads. I mean, roads are the one county service that every single one of us uses every day. And I th the, it really is the bottom line for a lot of people, as we heard during public comments, uh, earlier in this meeting, and I can tell you, just getting through an election cycle, it's it's what people care most about is roads, um, and you know, arguably, roads are emergency facilities, right? I mean, if you don't have road access, um, that's that's definitely an emergency. So I know we, you know, we're we're paying now for the poor state of our roads, but we're not. What I don't see here is 
any proactive investment in our roads. I mean, particularly, for example, culverts. You know, our culverts are in, in horrible condition all over the place. Uh, you know, if you don't if you don't control water management, I mean, as you just explained in your roof example, uh, Budget Manager Pimentel, if we don't control the water, then we're ultimately looking at some much more expensive fixes down the line. Um, and right now, I mean, we're basically, by, by not proactively investing in anything, we're, we're basically condemning uh, the county road network to further and, and likely much more rapid degradation. Um, I, I think we are going to need to, ha I mean, and it's it, looking at the DPW road maintenance budget, um, I don't see a whole lot of general fund revenues uh, being applied there. I mean, I know we're, we're largely depending um, on the uh, you know emergency repair funds flowing in from state and federal government. Um, so you know we need to look at what we can realistically do to proactively fund road maintenance, and uh, then we need to communicate you know realistically to the public what we what we can and can't do because um, you know, right now there's sort of a whole lot of expectation um, and not a lot of uh, clear communication on on what's feasible, and you know of course everyone as soon as as soon as you lose your road, it's an emergency. So we can't keep operating purely on an emergency basis. Um, yeah, I, I guess I can, well, I mean, the last thing I would say is, yeah, I certainly agree on this state, uh, the, the unfunded mandate issue. I mean, I don't think that the existing process to push back on unfunded mandates is sufficient. I mean, we just have to be a lot more clear that, um, well, you're not giving us money for these things, and so we're not doing them. That's why what makes them an unfunded mandate. Um, and yeah, I'm start, coming back from the last CSAC meeting um, last month, this was certainly a huge topic. Uh, I know in particular some of the other counties that are at the bottom end of that graph that you showed as far as the amount of property taxes, for example, our neighbors in San Benito County, really feeling the squeeze on this. Um, and hopefully, um, heck, our, our current speakers from San Benito County, um, we can we can get through to the rest of the legislature about it. But um, I think we're going to have to look at alternative means to push back um, working with with other counties. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you again for the presentation. I want to thank members of the public who are joining us today here in chambers and also online who've taken the time to um, really, you know, see the status of the county's budget um and and while it's concerning I, the one question i did want to have is that in the absence of these disasters i guess in you all's opinion how would you say the county has been doing in terms of managing the, the budget and county funds um, we've been um actually doing well um i mean if you look at all the initiatives we've done um in terms of funding new services new programs uh, you're going to hear about it through our uh, our probation department has had new service centers that are brand new. They're wonderful achievements. Uh, our public defender today bringing them into the county from being an outside contract. They provide so much more services that were not present in the public in the past. Uh, our public health department, our behavioral health department, human services. There's just we've done a lot, uh, and we are doing more than we've ever done in terms of helping the homeless population. Um, the, yeah, so the, the big issues that we're facing is, you know, the global climate change and the impact of the nat of the natural disasters on us. And then the other issue is these unfunded, um, mandates, which are, uh, certainly no one would argue that the goal of many of these programs are good, but the issue is how do you fund that? And I, and the idea that's sort of magical thinking at the part of the state that we can require this program, impose it on counties and somehow they're going to fund it. It's just no no county is in a position to be able to fund those very extensive programs, and they're all coming. There's um, I, I mentioned the ones that that we're very concerned about, but there's even more than that. So um, absent those, we would we've actually done a lot, and we've increased our number of services we've been providing the community. The South County Government Center, uh, the Children's Crisis Stabilization Center, are going to be transformative for our county. Incredible new services to the community. Um, the other thing is that Public Works has repaired, um, you know, you look at the millions of dollars of storm damage they've repaired. It's amazing the work that they have done. It's too much. You know, we can't keep up. But if you look at them, that $250 million that we spent, these were good projects. They're wonderful projects. You can go right, drive through the incorporated area and see all the roads we've repaired. It's just that it's too much and we can't keep up. Mm -hmm. And the funding model is just outmoded. 
needs to change. But we've done a lot, and as as a county, I think we have a lot to be proud of. Thank you, um, and I I couldn't agree more. I think it's just really important that we highlight the and we celebrate the achievements that the county is making, because you know I think in other communities it can be the reason why your budget is not doing well was because of mismanagement of money, and that's not the case here. For us, the big impact is that we're just getting hit time and time again with all these natural disasters and the intensity and frequency of them is such that it's very challenging for us to keep up with the amount of impacts we're facing here in the community because I know that we're one of the most geologically unstable communities in terms of landslides. So there's a lot of things that are kind of outside of our control, but I, I want to say that I think that we're doing a great job of trying to keep the county rolling um, in the face of disaster. And so my hope is that we can continue and really start strongly expressing, you know, to our state and federal elected officials um, that, you know, we need their support in these times. And we are identifying problems um, with outdated systems and ways of doing business that need to be significantly changed in a very short period of time. And so as challenging as that might be, I think it's really important that we're trying to continue to get that message out there so we can get resources to us in a timely manner. Um, in addition to that, you know, I, with the unfunded mandates, I think we need to continue to send letters to our uh, state elected representatives that hopefully they will vote against um, any legislation that comes forward that's pushing these state mandates. We understand that, you know, people have relationships in at the state, but it's really important that they're understanding how we're being impacted here locally. And so um, I, I'm committed to, to doing that as chair and as a member of this board, and I hope that we can continue to pay attention to the state legislation so we're not blindsided by a bunch of these unfunded mandates. Um, I, I think that the expansion of uh, services in South County is really great, and I'm actually very happy that we've been able to purchase the new building. I mean, the idea that we would be paying for rent, that we wouldn't, and we wouldn't have an asset physically, um, I think that'd be a, a waste of tax dollars when we can take the same amount we'd be paying um, almost annually in rent purchase a facility and then that's an asset that the county owns. And so if at some point in time the county wanted to sell the building, that's revenue that would come back to us um, and then we're not paying somebody's rent. And so I think that that actually was a good investment if we think about from a climate perspective, if we expand services and get them closer to where people, to people who need them, then that's less vehicle miles traveled, which means less carbon going into our atmosphere and another way of we're contributing to help, to hopefully reduce our impacts on climate change. So I do think that that was a great investment and I'm glad we're seeing that, um, that that's going to be online soon. Um, I also do, you know, when we're, when we're talking about the revenue losses, I just want to take a moment to thank the members of the community um, who supported Measure K. Um, that was our sales tax measure. And um, while it's not perfect, it is a new source of revenue that's coming in. And I just want to make sure it's clear as well. By increasing our sales tax from 9 to 9.5%, that is not exhausted um, how much more we can increase it. We still have another 0.25% that we could raise the sales tax in the future. And I think that we're in a much better position than some of the other jurisdictions in our community because as they're facing challenges, they're not going to have the ability to raise their sales tax measure any further. And we do reserve that capability. And so um, as we're, you know, down the road, seeing how things play out with Measure K, you know, I just want to highlight that we do have another future opportunity um, around the sales tax as well. Um, and then finally, I think that it's really important as we're having these discussions that we uh, are, are considering setting aside funding to um, support these unfunded mandates. We've given ourselves a two-year window for SB 43, but, you know, we don't want to put ourselves in a situation in the future where, you know, we have to then enforce SB 43 and we're not ready and some of the other mandates. Um, and I think it's really important as well that as we're rolling these out, we're letting our state representatives know like, hey, this is how this is impacting the county. And if there's a way for you all to find funding, it would be beneficial to us since this is something that you all are mandating us to do and we don't have the resources. Um, and then um, finally, you know, I, I do want to thank uh, the county for all the work they're doing to address homelessness. Um, I think that in the past, you know, there was this kind of perception that the county wasn't doing anything, but it's clear that we're investing into many programs and services to help address the homelessness problem. And I, and I do want to um, comment on some of the things that COPA brought up because, you know, we do have some programs that help with tenant protections. Um, we have a tenant attorney pilot program, which I've been hearing very positive responses about. And so my hope is that we can 
see how that program's going and continue to fund that program as well because as we're looking at ways to prevent people from going into homelessness and then spending more money on when people become homeless versus keeping them housed, I think we should continue to emphasize how we can save the county money by keeping people in housing as well. And so with that, I think that um, the only action on this item is to accept the report and continue the budget public hearing to May 21st. And so there's a motion at this time and I'll go ahead and- I'll make the motion to move and accept the file, the, the budget. And continue the hearings till May 21st. Yes, and continue the hearings till May 21st. Yeah, May 21st. Yes. We have a motion by Supervisor Hernandez, second, second by Supervisor Friend. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to the clerk to please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Yes. McPherson? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you all again for that presentation. We look forward to the other uh, presentations that will occur starting on May 21st. Um, okay, the next item is open a sale of surplus county owned property, commonly known as 105 Esplanade Ave, APN 042-151-31 pursuant to the terms and conditions stipulated in the Board of Supervisors Resolution number 163-2023 and Planning Commission Resolution number 2023-04 and take related actions. And so I'll turn it over to um, our represent representative from Community Development and Infrastructure. Hi, good afternoon, Chair, members of the board. My name is Kimberly Finley. I'm the Chief Real Property Agent with the Department of Community Development and Infrastructure. I appear before you today to request a public surplus sale of county-owned real property located at 105 Esplanade Avenue, APN 04215131. This property was acquired via tax sale um, in resolution number 250-2016 for potential expansion of the adjacent county-owned sanitation treatment facility. The property is approximately 0.06 acres and lies on the north side of Esplanade Avenue in the coastal zone of Aptos. Aptos Creek is located approximately 100 feet west of the property and the entire property lies within the FEMA designated AE flood zone. Properties located within the map floodway are subject to geologic hazards ordinance, thereby restricting placement of permanent structures within the floodway. As a result of the floodway hazards, the property has limited development potential, and due to these constraints, it has remained vacant since purchased by the county. On August 22nd, 2023, the board adopted resolution number 163, 2023, declaring the property surplus and stating the intention to dispose of the property. The mandatory state requirements have now been met to dispose of this property. On May 24th, 2023, the Planning Commission adopted resolution number 2023-04, finding the disposition of the property in conformity with the general plan. The necessary Surplus Lands Act notice of availability was posted for 60 days. On March 12th, 2024, the board approved today's meeting as the date, time, and place to conduct a public auction for the sale of the property for a minimum bid of $240,000. The clerk of the board and real property staff have adequately posted and noticed the sale in conformance with the government code. The board is now able to conduct a public hearing to sell the surplus property. Therefore, the real property section recommends the following. Number one, open a public sale of surplus county-owned property commonly known as 105 Esplanade pursuant to the terms and conditions stipulated in the Board of Supervisors Resolution 163-2023 and Planning Commission Resolution number 2023-04. Direct staff to open, examine, qualify, and declare all sealed bids received for the sale of the property. Call for oral bids for the sale of the property that exceed the highest written offer by at least 5%. Call for public comments. Accept the highest qualified written or oral bid received for the sale of the property or reject all bids and withdraw the property from the surplus sale. Close the public sale of surplus county owned property and authorize the Deputy CAO, Director of Community Development and Infrastructure to negotiate and execute a purchase and sale agreement and related necessary steps to effectuate the sale of the property. 
that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to look over to county council to see uh, how we should proceed since I've never done one of these before. So at this moment in time, would I then need to open the sale proceedings and um, and have staff open and read any bids, written bids received? That's the first step, yes. Okay, so we will open the sale proceedings and I'll ask staff if they can open and read any written bids that they've received. We have received no written bids. Okay. Um, are there any members of the public who would like to make a bid on this property? Again, it must be 5% above the highest. Well, there's no, there are no written bids, but. Um, so at least $240,000. $240,000. Do we have anybody? $240,000. Going once, once. <laughs> going twice. We've got no bids. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. Are there any members of the public online who would like to bid? We do have a speaker with their hand raised, though I'm not sure if they're making a bid or if they're making public comment. Okay. Call in user one, are you attempting to make a bid? Um, <clears throat> Marilyn and Kara, I, you gave um, Ms. Ms. Uh, are you a report are you, just now. Are you, Ms. Wait, Ms. Garrett, are you giving? Okay, I'm going to take that as a no, yeah. so if you can please. Thank you. I'm. I'm what? Okay. Um, seeing that there are no bids, I'm wondering if staff can help us understand what the next steps would be. Yeah, the next thing, the next thing you would do is call for public comment. We, 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 the second step was to ask for oral bids. You've received no oral bids. You would take public comment on this item. Um, that's the third step. All right. There are members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item who are here in chambers. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. Um, I know the history of this parcel. And what I would like to ask um, you to do is to offer first a right of purchase to the adjacent owner, current owner of the former Seabreeze Tavern, which burned down. Um, I remember that the county took this parcel essentially from the former owner, Mr. Rich McGinnis because he was not a very popular person. He, uh, he, he did things that, that upset the neighbors. And at the time that the county took this property, I believe it was um, under, under a bit of duress on the part of Mr. McGinnis. I have watched this parcel, the county spend money to uh, develop it as a park. I have watched this county contract with a concessionaire that rarely showed up. So I'm very happy that the county is finally going to divest it. I think it's interesting that in the staff report, it claims the county bought it as a possible expansion of the uh, sewage treatment, sewage pump station adjacent. I don't think that was ever the intention. So I'm, I'm very glad that the county's getting rid of it. Rid of it. I hope it will be sold to, uh, with first right of purchase to the property owner um, that owns the former Seabreeze Tavern site so that they can develop hopefully a very nice hotel or something like that that will bring the county some transient occupancy tax and some revenue for that area and restore the economic vitality of that area. Um, I, I ask that you contact that property owner directly and ask them. I think you will get a good result, and I would like to see that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there many any other members of the public who want to comment on this item? Seeing none here in chambers, is there any member of the public online who'd like to comment on this item? Yes, Chair. Call in user one. Your microphone is now available. Thanks to Becky Steinbrenner for explaining some of the history of the property and putting it in context. I didn't hear that on the original uh, presentation. And I have a question I'd like you to respond to. Over the years, and I have attended board meetings for over 20 years since I retired from teaching in 2000, I see sale of surplus county-owned property. Could somebody there explain 
how what is this category how is it determined something is surplus because it seems county owned belongs to the people of the county could you please clarify the criteria for that and i think it would help other people listening um understand the process here thank you i'll listen for the response We have no further speakers. So then we will close public comment and bring it back to the board. So the next step would be to close the public yeah, sale. Means. So the next step would be to close the public sale. So I do it or I yes, get a motion from you, the board? You no, know, you would just okay. go ahead and do it. You so we're going we're gonna to close the uh, sale proceedings and now you bring it back to the board for discussion. Now we bring it back to the board for discussion. Mr. Vice Chair, quick question. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, some of that history wasn't that was presented wasn't totally accurate, but that's okay. I mean, this was a default tax sale. Somebody who hadn't paid for many years on that on that property, which is why, as with many other default properties, the county has an ability to uh, collect that property. There was an intention, you were correct, uh, to potentially use it for park space. There was also a request from San from uh, for it to be a potential expansion of, the, of sanitation. Uh, the main thing was getting it as a county asset and seeing what was possible. My question for you uh, would be um, if there, and the two property owners adjacent had an opportunity to purchase this. They were contacted and neither one of them obviously bid on it. Um, is there a possibility we've gone to the surplus component? Can it is sale the only option moving forward or could we still do a leasing opportunity on this property? So thank you. Yes, we we have been in contact with the two uh, adjacent property owners and they had their opportunity to um, bid today and they did not. Um, I spoke with county council um, in anticipation of not receiving a, any bids today and, and to discuss what our next steps might be. Um, I asked if we could enter into direct negotiations. Uh, the initial take on our on our ability to move forward is that we would have to hold another auction and we could reduce the fair market value and have another competitive competitive public bid for the property if we still wanted to sell it um, we discussed a sale we did not discuss the lease portion i'm not sure if leasing rather than selling would uh change the necessary steps that we would take I mean, so if we, if, if we were going to lease the property, we would have to take a look at taking it off of the sub surplus list and, right. and, and, and then deciding what we want to do as an entity with the property. It would no longer be surplus. Um, so what, what we would want to, I would want to, um, you know, take the board's direction on investigating anything that the board wants us to investigate and then have staff come back with recommendations on what to do with this property. And that could include uh, a recommendation to uh, hold another public auction with a lower first bid amount, or it could include investigate what it would take to take it off a surplus uh, list and um, do whatever else the board wants to do with the property, including leasing it. I think that Okay, thank you for that. I mean, it, it, uh, to me, I feel like that's that's a reasonable next step, which would be to come back with options that the board can choose. I mean, I'm open to, I mean, the reality is, is that the timing of this when COVID hit was pretty difficult to find folks that were interested in, in using the space. Um, but I mean, if the adjacent property owners don't want to purchase it, I see nothing wrong with, you know, also the possibility of, of leasing even to things that could be of, of value to the community there and the money going back uh, to parks for reinvestment, which was really, I think, the initial um, one of our two initial ideas on it. But I, I mean, I'd be open to providing that direction for you to explore whether that's a viable option and or a lower sale price. It doesn't strike me, given the sale price that was mentioned, that a reduction is necessarily going to change the outcome. This was a pretty minimal cost the reality i think is that since it's so limited of what you can develop there because of the changes in the fema structure of the flood zone 
This is why the sea breeze has been empty this time, because people have been purchasing things down there with a belief that they're right next to the water, and this is a great deal, but you actually can't do much uh, in that area. So um, I'd be comfortable, if the board is comfortable with, with um, what, do we need to make a motion to reject? I mean, there's no, no bids, it's just now direction, I suppose. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, um, the board could choose to take no action and and uh, not have a motion on this at all. We've closed the public sale without a sale. Um, if your board wanted to us to take further action, you could give us a direction to take further action. Okay, well then, then I'll move to direct CDI staff to explore with parks the possibility of a leasing structure and or a reduction in sale price moving forward and come back to the board with a recommendation. I'll second that. Yeah, so we have a motion by Supervisor Friends, seconded by Supervisor Hernandez, and I'll go ahead and call for roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you, staff, for the presentation on that, and hopefully we'll, when it comes back, we'll have some options to explore. Okay, so the next item on our agenda is item number nine, consider approving in concept Ordinance amending Chapter 8.03 of the Santa Cruz County Code regarding alcohol beverage retail outlet nuisance abatement program. Schedule the ordinance for second reading and final adoption on April 3rd, 2024, and take related actions. I'll turn over to staff from the Sheriff's Department to conduct the presentation on this item. Welcome. Good morning, Chair Cummings and other members of the board. My name is Dee Baldwin. I'm a lieutenant at the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office. Oh, it should be on. Today, I'm here to present recommended update and propose clarification to our alcoholic beverage retail outlet nuisance abatement program. Our goal is to refine and clarify existing regulations while fostering a more collaborative relationship with businesses. The board adopted the alcoholic beverage retail outlet nuisance abatement program in 2017. The program was created to address potential uh, problems relating to public consumption of alcohol in the county. This was highlighted by alarming statistics that 40% of jail bookings were alcohol-related issues alongside more than 1,000 DUI arrests by the California Highway Patrol within our county alone. These numbers, coupled with the existence of more than 280 alcoholic beverage retail outlets in the unincorporated areas, underline the importance of a structured approach to mitigate adverse effects of alcohol sale and consumption in our community. The program's introduction established a framework that included local certification of outlets, setting performance standards, implementing an enforcement process, and creating a financial mechanism to support these operations. Over the past five years, the program has proven effective, allowing Sheriff's Office Alcohol Compliance Unit to perform approximately 448 annual inspections, conduct 176 decoy operations, and issue 58 citations, demonstrating our commitment to upholding public safety and compliance with state regulations. In reviewing the existing code, we identified several amendments to bring increased clarity and efficiency to the program, particularly in the following areas. The first one is in definitions. We propose adding the definition of higher risk alcohol outlet to increase clarity within the code. This was already in the um, uh, fee schedule. It just was not defined within the code. So we're just trying to standardize what's written in the code to what's in the fee schedule. The second was to change the program operation and training requirements. The proposed amendments will now mirror the state regulation in regard to inspections and mandated employee training. No longer will we have a different county code that's, that varies compared to state regulations. The third was form submissions. The proposed amendments will now guide new outlets to submit copies of what forms they're submitted to the state, in turn reducing redundant documentation. The final change is a update to the certification fee. The certification fee section now includes the definitions used to calculate annual cost. Again, this just mirrors the unified fee schedule and is now codified to make it clear. The proposed amendments represent our commitment to address the current needs, but also anticipate future challenges. In closing, we're asking the board to approve these proposed revisions to assist our collective effort to combat alcohol-related nuisances and enhance public safety. Thank you for your attention and consideration, and we're open to any questions. <laughs> Thank you for that presentation. We're going to go ahead and open up to the public to see if there's any member of the public who has questions or comments on this item. Seeing none here in chambers, is there anyone online who'd like to comment on this item? Yes, Chair, we have a speaker online. Tim, your microphone's now available. 
Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Fully supportive of the two gentlemen speaking before you right now in regards to this measure. I have my wife and children that, that drive on our roads and uh, anything that could be done to reduce uh, DUI on the road, that would be very helpful for my family. Thank you very much. Thank you. Call in user one, your microphone's now available. I'm for upholding public safety. I'd like to see this expanded to other areas by getting rid of cell towers and wireless technology endangering the public safety. Personally, I've never been drunk in my life because I never liked the way drunk people behaved and I didn't grow up in an alcoholic family, fortunately. Uh, anything to genuinely protect, uphold public safety is worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board, see if there's any questions, comments, Supervisor Friend. Lieutenant Baldwin, appreciate the presentation and the simplification of the ordinance. Um, I'm sure you're already doing it, but any outreach you could do to the impacted outlets would be appreciated, but it's a much uh, more simplified version, so I appreciate your work on it. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. All right, any further questions or comments from members of the board? Seeing none, I just want to thank you all for bringing this to our attention. It seems pretty straightforward and it seems like it's going to just really align uh, the policy that we have here in the county. And so with that, I'll ask the clerk to call a roll call vote on this item. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Fernandez? Yes. McPherson? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. I pass it unanimously. Thank you. All right, next item on our agenda, hold public hearing to consider proposed 2024-25 benefit assessment rates for county service area number 46. Pinecrest, continue the public hearing to June 4th, 2024, and take related actions. And so I'll turn it over to staff and CDI to lead us on the presentation on this item. Welcome. Oops, the, the gray button on the base of the microphone. Up a little. Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Board. My name is Christine Hicks. I'm the Administrative Services Manager for Public Works. And one of my roles is to manage the road county service areas, two of which are the next agenda items. County service area number 46, Pinecrest, in Boulder Creek, is seeking an election to decrease their benefit assessment rate for fiscal year 2024-25. The CSA had storm damage in 2017 for which they had done an election to raise their rates. And now that the storm damage repairs are complete, they're looking to uh, return their rates to the previous amounts, which was $10,792. The proposed decrease will affect 31 of the 38 parcels in this CSA and ballots were mailed out on February 13th of this year. The recommendation, recommended actions for the board today are to open the public hearing, request the submittal of ballots, close the public comments portion of this hearing, and then continue the public hearing to June 4th to allow time for tabulation and certification of the votes. Staff is available to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions or comments from the board? And then decreasing these rates is going to lower the revenue that's coming in. Um, if another disaster hits and they, would they just carry over or would that delay them uh, the project from getting done if it's needed to be done, if they don't have the revenue to do it? They could use their existing funds if they had sufficient funds, or they could uh, go through the benefit, of benefit assessment process of another election to create a new revenue stream for those repairs. Okay. All right, so if there's no further questions or comments, I guess I can go ahead and open up the public hearing uh, to hear any objections or protests, if any, to the proposed benefit assessment for CSA number 46 Pinecrest. So if, there are, if there's any members of the public who'd like to speak on this item, um, please approach the podium. Or um, and, and if there's no one here in public, then we will go to speakers who are online. Thank you. Becky Steinbrunner, I do not live in this road maintenance CSA, but I live in another. And um, I, I just would like to ask 
um, if it was at the time that the uh, the benefit assessment was passed, if it, the uh, voters were told that it would decrease, I was surprised to see that it de they were voting to decrease it. It's a rare thing, but um, w was that specified in the language of what they approved when they uh, approved to increase? their own assessments and thank you for your good work i appreciate you very much thank you are any members of the public who are online would like to speak on this item i see no speakers online chair okay thank you um another item on this uh the agenda is the request of submittal of all ballots for the proposed 2024 25 benefit assessment for csa number 46 Pinecrest. so that request is something that i'm making right now okay there we go. That's something that you would do. You would request that. All right. So I'm also making that request uh, for the submittal of all ballots for the proposed 2024-25 benefit assessment for CSA number 46 Pinecrest. Since uh, there's no more, there's no other members of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item. We're going to close the public comment portion of the public hearing. And I guess we will now need a motion to continue the public hearing to June 4th, 2024 to allow for tabulation and certification of the ballots. And so if there's a member of the board who'd like to make that a motion. Second. Okay, so we have a motion by Supervisor McPherson, seconded by Supervisor Hernandez to continue the public hearing to June 4th, 2024, to allow for tabulation and certification of the ballots. And I'd like to ask for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Yes. McPherson? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. And brings us on to our second, well, our next item, which is to hold public hearing to consider proposed 2024-25 benefit assessment rates for county service area number 51, Hopkins Gulch, continue the public hearing to June 4th, 2024, and take related actions. I'll turn it back over to staff. Thank you. Uh, similarly, this county service area number 51, Hopkins Gulch in Boulder Creek is having an ele election to increase their assessment rates for 2024-25. The background on this is that during the December 22 and January 23 uh, storms, they sustained significant damage to their roads. And uh, this election increase is to uh, gain funds for beginning the repairs. Ballots were mailed to the 38 affected parcels in the CSA on February 13th. And if passed, the election would provide about $180,000 in revenue for them to get started fixing the roads. The recommended do I need to read those, the recommended actions? Um, to open the public hearing, request the submittal of ballots, close the public comments, and continue the public hearing to June 4th to allow for tabulation and certification of the votes. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from board members? So the 108 is all they need for the repairs, or the 180, sorry, is all they need for the repairs, or they need more? They... This will begin the process oh. of the engineering to design the repairs. It, and they're waiting also to see whether FEMA will obligate and provide public assistance to allow for more elaborate repairs on the damages. So once they're done, they'll have the same option as the previous item that we had? Uh, yes, sir. This is a single year's um, increase, and that's uh, specified in the resolution, I believe. All right. Thank you. All right. So that I'll open the public hearing and hear objections or protests, if any, to the proposed benefit assessment for CSA number 51 Hopkins Gulch. And I'll also request the submittal of all ballots for the proposed 2024-25 benefit assessment for CSA number 51 Hopkins Gulch. So if there's any member of the public uh, who would like to speak on this item, please approach the podium at this time. Okay, seeing none here in person, is there any member of the public online who would like to comment on this item? We have no speakers online, Chair. Okay, with that, I'll bring it back to the board uh, for action. And the action item here is to continue the public hearing to June 4th, 2024, to allow for a tabulation and certification of the ballots. Second. So we have a motion by Supervisor McPherson, seconded by Supervisor Hernandez, and I'll uh, call roll call vote on this item. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Hernandez? Yes. McPherson? Aye. And Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. So we have one more item on our regularly scheduled agenda. This is item number 15 that was pulled from consent by Supervisor Koenig. Um, 
And uh, with and this item is to adopt an ordinance of the Board of Supervisors of the County of Santa Cruz repealing and replacing Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 9.54 relating to the regulation of motorized bicycles and motorized scooters and electric bi bicycles. And I'll turn it over to Supervisor Koenig uh, since he was the board member that pulled this item. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as I stated in my comments earlier, um, I, you know, I believe that we are close with this ordinance, but I'd heard some concerns um, from folks, particularly Ecology Action, which does a lot of the bike education uh, and outreach in our community about the, par the part that relates specifically to parks. Um, and that is, um, I, I was unaware, but they actually do um, some of their bike education within county parks today, and they're worried that this would exclude that. Um, they mentioned that they do that at uh, Pinot Lake County Park, um, and then also pointing out that there are portions of parks that serve as vital connections within our bike network, uh, which is, as I think many of you know, fragmented uh, in many places. And so parks serve as uh, an essential way to fill the gap. Now, I think that it certainly is possible that within um, the existing ordinance, these could be designated as bikeways um, and therefore um, still allow e-bike usage and, and still serve uh, that function as, as filling the bike network. Um, but I just wanted to postpone a final approval of this a little bit to make sure that we do have the opportunity to sit down uh, with parks and ecology action um, and look at those areas, make sure um, that there is the opportunity to, um, in fact, do that. And that if, if we are going to designate them as bikeways, that some of the additional signage can happen relatively quickly uh, after the implementation of the ordinance. Uh, I do apologize for not making sure that this uh, was addressed sooner um, before bringing forward the first read. Um, but, uh, you know, ultimately, it, I hope that we can uh, address any concerns uh, before bringing it back. I would suggest the May 14th meeting. Um, any other comments from Supervisor Supervisor Friend? Yeah, um, I appreciate um, the comments. Actually, I don't think it's necessary. And so, because I'll say this, bikeways are defined under state code. We already gave authority to the parks director to uh, make determinations within parks. So I feel like we can move forward with the way the ordinance is today and then just provide the additional direction for those meetings to happen because it sounds like this is not an ordinance revision. It's an individual discussion about uh, what the parks director feels comfortable with in certain parks because given the bikeways already defined under state code, we can't shift that by this further discussion within the ordinance. And so um, I'd be I'd be comfortable with us moving forward with the additional direction just to have those meetings of which parks are appropriate outside of the bikeways for this action. Um, I think that if we're gonna open up any park within a district, I'd like to hope that the parks director would have that conversation with a supervisor. I think that all the issues that we enumerated about the safety of e-bikes uh, within parks and on sidewalks still exist today. Um, I don't believe Ecology Action actually does bike education work with e-bikes. I mean, I think that this concern is, is for non-motorized, so I'm not sure how much this applies at all. But um, I don't know that the delay is necessary because I think it's already within the ordinance. So um, as strange as it sounds, because we brought the item together, uh, I'm supportive of maintaining it as it is and just uh, directing the parks director to have the exact discussions that you, that you were, um, uh, you're, you're asking for. Sure. Uh, if I can add a, a little bit more elaboration, I mean, there are there are other concerns that I heard as well. I mean, so for example, um, I heard from members of the mountain bike community who say, well, is this going to prohibit all electric mountain bike usage, right? I think the, the issue there is just one of messaging because most people don't understand the difference between a county park, a state park, where more of the mountain bike trails are, or city parks uh, like Davies de la Viega, which have um, some trails that are used beloved by mountain bikers. And so, um, you know, part of the request was to look at, uh, you, you know, should we, should we bring these regulations forward uh, in a slightly different way that could ultimately address just like that clarity of messaging so that when we put out a rule, it doesn't matter if you know whether it's a state or county park, you just, you know, a 10 year old can follow the rule. Okay. Are there any further questions or comments at this time, board members? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to open up to public comment. I, I do have a couple of comments. I'll make what I want to bring it back, but I want to open up to members of the public to see if any member of the public would like to speak to us on this item. I, I mean, I would appreciate feedback from the parks director since he's been waiting on Absolutely. this item just to get your sense of this. <clears throat> yeah. I, I, so, uh, good afternoon, uh, Jeff Dowden, your county parks director. Thank you, Chair Cummins, fellow board members. Um, I think that we have a very complicated issue right now in California. I think we're seeing this around the state, seeing, seeing it at a local level, regional level. I think that we're not going to be able to solve it 
with an ordinance. This is going to take uh, interactive discussions, ongoing um, deliberations with the different communities that are involved. Um, the technology is continuing to evolve, how that technology is used and what trails are allowed on, how they impact our natural resources and what impacts they have. Those are all very important things, especially as we talk about the mountain biking community getting out into our natural areas. Um, so I guess with that said, um, I don't want to get in the middle of a discussion with the board here. I don't want to get in between um, uh, the process, but I think I could do both. I sound like Switzerland right now, I know, but I think I could do both easily. Um, and regardless of what happens here, I'm going to and have continued to have to have discussions with mountain biking community um, and the bicycle community and those folks who are becoming this of people who are riding basically electric motorcycles and um, they are defined if you look in the vehicle code as electric motorcycles so problems for us are going to continue to be problems for us um, and what's decided here will inform us and help us but we're going to have to do more from here if you had questions thank you um any questions from board members i guess I'm like, I'm also here, you know, like, you know, the, the, there's two supervisors who brought this forward and I feel kind of in, I wouldn't say indifferent, but I do, you know, from Supervisor Koenig's perspective, feel that there are some people in the community who brought, address, who've raised some concerns around this and kind of want to see if they can have their concerns addressed before we take any action. Um, and then I also hear my other colleagues who brought this forward stating that it seems like this has already worked out. And so um, I'm just wondering if, we continue the item. Can there be some way to work this out where staff can work with the two supervisors and the community members, and then it can come back before, maybe with no changes, or it can come back with changes for another first reading. If that's an option that might be considered as well. So you 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 wouldn't continue the item. You would just you would just reject staff's uh, recommendation to adopt the ordinance and. Um, and give additional direction, whatever additional direction you wanted to, and then staff would bring something back for first read. Got it. We'd do the whole process again. Got it. Two, we'd bring it back right. twice. Right. Right. I I do think, uh, Chair. I'm sorry to if I'm interrupting. Is okay. Yeah. Uh, I do think that um, the authority that was given to us, as both uh, through the state through the statute and through our county ordinance, it's currently as it's written or written in this proposal. Um, gives the director the ability to continue to manage this problem. I think that language is 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 clear to me, and we also have other language in our our county ordinances that gives us the authority as the parks department, as the director, to to continue to manage that. So, I guess um, I feel like I have the tools. It doesn't sound like you feel like I have the tools. So, I that's kind of what I'm saying. I'm. Happy for that clarification because I guess you know that's for me it, it wasn't clear whether you had those tools or not. So I hope that that provides some clarification. But I'm going to go ahead and continue to see if there's any members of the public. Thank you for your comments and see if there's any other members of the public here who'd like to speak to us on this item. Seeing none here in person, is there any member of the public online who'd like to speak to us on this item? Yes, Chair, we do have speakers online. Call in user one. Your microphone is now available. Thanks for the comments of the park director stating these are electric motorcycles. It brings up the question if they should be under a different category than bikes with motor vehicle codes. My sense of observations is that there's a lot of dangers with these. I certainly wouldn't want to see them in parks. I've seen how my mountain bikes tear up the trails with the electric bikes. I would expect it would be um, even more. And I was dismayed at the last discussion of this when two members of the public uh, made a reasonable uh, recommendation to prohibit them on sidewalks. And as I recall, you didn't do that. I think they need to be banned from certain areas, like parks. That's my sense of it. I also worry about the electromagnetic fields that I know are unhealthy with these bikes. 
um, they're, they seem quite dangerous to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tim, your microphone is now available. Hello. Thank, thank you again for allowing me to speak. Um, the uh, issue of e-bikes, yeah, th there are huge issues, huge liability to the county uh, for both, uh, you know, sidewalks and things like that, and also for trails all throughout your entire county, throughout your forests and around your rivers and streams and everything. So I've talked extensively about this up in Tahoe. And just so you know, the damage is incredible that folks are doing out in our backcountry areas. And uh, along with the bikes, not just at the trails, but they cart all kinds of other little devices in there to bring all their food products and everything else. And they leave the garbage all over the forest. And uh, I was one of the guys responsible for cleaning it. Well, I wasn't responsible, but it was my community. And I love my beaches in Tahoe. So I spent a lot of effort picking up awesome amounts of gar garbage over the last couple of decades in, on the East Shore of Lake Tahoe. So, you know, in regards to our forests, not all things are climate change, by the way. Okay. And this relates to e-bikes. Okay. What it is, is you have a lot of forests that are clear cut. They grew back. Folks didn't manage them very well. And then you get all these folks that come into our forested lands and they do all these nefarious things. And some of these fires are arson. Okay. And because of suppression, it makes it so much harder to control them in a, in a warming environment and a climate damaged world. You could look at South Tahoe. All of you should travel up there and take a look at that. The, the damage from fire is incredible off of Highway 50 and around Markleyville and whatnot. So the e-bike issue is a huge liability to the county, a huge public safety issue. And uh, I'm not too enthused about a bunch of motorized type of vehicles being able to rip up our trails and cruise through our forests. Okay, so Supervisor Koenig is doing the right thing and pulling back a little bit here to discuss this with you a little bit more. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any other members of the public online that would like to speak to us on this item? Yes, Chair. Thank you. Gene Brocklebank, your microphone's now available. This ordinance was supposed to be for safety due to the county's contract with B-Cycle, which will see 600 to 1,000 more B-Cyclists in addition to the growing use of private e-bikes. Right now, we see at least half of e-bikes operated dangerously in violation of rules of the road and common decency. To add speeding bicyclists approaching sidewalks from all directions is just wrong, and it makes a mockery of walkable cities goal. The more e-bikes are allowed on sidewalks, the fewer pedestrians there will be. So at a minimum, this ordinance needs more work. At a minimum, reverse the order of exception A to make it clear that the lack of a bike lane is the first thing to be noted. Clarify how the county's infrastructure department will identify sidewalks to authorize motorized bicycle usage. I'm glad Director Gaffney got up and spoke to you. Regarding that exemption, I want to know if the Parks Commission, and therefore the public, will be involved in the Parks Director's unilateral decision, not just the mountain biking community. Last month, the purpose of the proposed ordinance was to, quote, protect the public's health, safety, and welfare, to prevent damage to plants, wildlife, wildlife habitat, water resources, etc. The new e-bikes are huge, some with tires three times the dimension of street bikes. Walkers meeting bikes, such bikes on trails is already a disaster, and the same can be said about many any animals who get in the way. How about a snake or a salamander? Unfortunately, one of the exceptions is being turned into a mountain biking industry's dream come true of opening up all park land and natural areas to provide for dirt and mud speed thrills. You may count on it, there will be off-road vehicle usage. I say it's back to the drawing board on this ordinance with a focus on safety for pedestrians as well as on trails. Thank you. Thank you. We have no further speakers online, Chair. Okay. Looks like there was at least one speaker here with us in the public who wanted to speak. So go ahead, Thank go. you. Thank you for letting me speak now. Becky Steinbrunner. Um, I 
Uh, while I'm confident that Director Gaffney feels he has the tools to address this within county parks, Santa Cruz County has a lot of state park property. Do we have any um, any input from state parks or friends of state parks on this issue? I live next to Nicene Mark State Park, which is very, very heavily used by both hikers and bikers. Um, a lot of the hikers have have uh, strollers. So I think it would be a disaster to have e-bikes on trails in that park. And I would like to know what tools state parks has, uh, similar to what Mr. Gaffney assures you that the county parks has to address this safety issue. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, with that, I'll bring it back to the board. And I will just, uh, one comment I'd like to make is that, you know, since state parks is its own agency i believe that they that these that the ordinance that's before us if it is to pass it would not apply to state parks since they're a separate agency they have their own rule structure so i would just encourage reaching out to state parks to understand what their guidelines are and our state elected representatives would be some folks who might be able to weigh in in terms of how those um open spaces are regulated with regards to electric bikes so. well i mean the point of the ordinance was to create a regulatory structure on something that isn't regulated right now. And there will be additional state laws that are shifting on usage and on licensure and helmets and stuff that have been introduced. But this was to create something at the county level that uh, created a safety, a safe regulatory structure. I mean, uh, to address at least a number of, I mean, under the current structure, there's no, there's no protections for what Ms. Brocklebank or, um, or others are, are expressing concerns of. So that was the point of, of bringing it forward. I, I would be concerned that allowing, I, I mean, to me, the only thing that could happen with these additional discussions would be a watering down of what we're proposing, which would, in my opinion, make it less safe in, in, in parks and, and local areas. So um, I'm prepared to move. I mean, we can have, uh, I think we should do this in two different motions, but I, I'm going to move the recommended actions as is, because I think we already have um, a good ordinance before us, and there can there, we had said at the last meeting this was an iterative discussion, and the parks director is going to continue to have these discussions. Um, but I don't see something positive for the ordinance <laughs> coming out of uh, allowing individual interest groups to just sort of nitpick what they don't like about the ordinance. Uh, I, mean, I think that what we need to do is maintain the safety first approach that we had brought forward on this. So I'm going to move the recommended actions, and if there's a second, then we can have a substitute motion as well. So a motion by Supervisor Friend. Is there a second to Supervisor Friend's motion? Yeah. Okay. So we have a second by Supervisor McPherson. Um, all right. I'll move a substitute motion that we reject staff's recommendation today, uh, direct staff to meet with the College of Action Health Services Agency and members of the public, return on May 14th for a first read. And if I could just comment, um, you know, one last response here, Supervisor Friend. I mean, I certainly hear you about concerns watering down the ordinance. That's uh, not my intention. Um, and I, I think the the issue I'm seeing right now is the communicability of the ordinance. I mean, as you heard, we still have a member in a public here concerned about the difference between state parks and county parks. Uh, I mean, ultimately, again, we want this ordinance to be understandable by a 10 year old, which you can and can't do, right? Because uh, as we see more and more kids are the ones actually uh, utilizing e-bikes. And so, um, you know, law is good when everyone can understand it and then agrees with it on, on some fundamental level and therefore follows it. Um, and if the law is a little bit confusing where, where it does and does not apply, then I think um, we're more likely to see people simply not follow it. And that would also uh, not fulfill the intent of the ordinance to increase safety. And to me, if it's a communications issue, then that's working with our PIO. It's not an ordinance revision issue. I mean, that's a, we have an ordinance. If there's confusion about the ordinance, we need to communicate about the ordinance better. Um, it's it's a communication thing, not an ordinance revision thing. I just think it's, it's sort of a strange strip, slippery slope that that the board does something and then opens it up for changes and revisions, you know, um, immediately because an interest group expresses a concern. I'm just concerned about just sort of that precedent. But anyway, we have a motion. I know there's a substitute motion on the floor. Yeah. So we have a substitute motion on the floor by Supervisor Koenig. Is there a second to that substitute motion? I'll, I'll second the substitute motion. 
Any further discussion on this item? Okay, seeing none, uh, let's go ahead and do a roll call vote on the substitute motion. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? No. Fernandez? Yes. McPherson? And Cummings? Aye. So it passes with Supervisors Koenig, McPherson, and Hernandez voting in support, and Supervisors and Friend voting in opposition. And so now the substitute motion is on the floor. Or that is that that's it. That's it. Substitute motion passes. The substitute motion passed, so the alter, the original motion dies. Okay. And so that concludes that item then, or do we take a vote on the subs on the new motion? That concludes that item. That concludes that item. Okay. Well, I guess my hope is that um this item can get resolved before it comes back. And um yeah, it's a tough position for I think some of us to be in, especially because we want to support both of the authors who brought this forward. Um, but, you know, if, if a, a little bit more time is necessary, then you know, guess we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens when it comes back to the board. So that concludes our regular agenda. And with that, we will move into our closed session. Just want to thank everybody for coming out today and for participating in our regularly scheduled meeting. And um, I'd like to, before we go into closed session, just like to ask uh, County Council if there's anything that we should anticipate being reported out of closed session. Not today. Okay. Thank you very much. And with that, we will close our regulars, regularly uh, scheduled